Okay, that's uh, 11 o'clock, so if people could take their seats, please. Okay, good morning, members. Uh, welcome to this meeting of full council. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded, and the recording will be made, made available on the council website for public listening. Could I remind members again to follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting microphones, switching off video uh, when you are not addressing the meeting. Should you wish to contribute to any item, you should write speak in the Teams chat function. That uh, uh, also applies to people in the room if they can. I don't think everybody's got a device with them, so if you haven't got a device that enables you to do that, wave vigorously at Nick and he will type you in um, to put you on the list. Uh, should you question be uh, or issue be raised by a previous speaker, please withdraw your request so that we deal with the business as efficiently as possible. Our council meetings this summer have been rather protracted and I hope we can all make an effort to be concise and stick to the items on the agenda today. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the, the meeting for any reason, can I remind you to either leave the team's meeting for that period of time and rejoin or you could write leave in the Teams chat function and then join when you come back in and that allows us to monitor member presence and to ensure that the meeting is correct. Uh, Nick, can you provide the sederant in indicating who is participating remotely and any apologies please? Uh, thanks Chair. Just, just, um, just for the benefit of any members who joined after I made the last announcement about um, fire alarms etc, there are no there is no fire alarm um, scheduled for this morning, so if it, it is to sound, um, then the exits are to the rear and, and to my right, and the muster point is in the car park across the way. Claire, do we have the... Thank you. So we have 17, 17 in the hall here at Easterbrook. We have apologies from um, Councillor Andrew Wood, and I'll just tally the numbers on Teams, Chair, just a second one. And we have 14 members joining remotely via Teams currently. Uh, I confirm my agreement to the participation of the remote members. Uh, we need now to move on to declarations of interest, and I'm going to ask, I know that uh, Gil McGregor has a declaration of an interest, which he may need to make. I also have a declaration of interest in item, item 15, which is the exempt item. I have been volunteering three times a week with food trains since the beginning of April. Uh, unfortunately, I'll no, no longer be able to do that once business resumes its normal, uh, in its normal way, which is a, it's a shame. But because I have been doing that, um, I will absent myself from the discussion and the decision on item 15, as uh, I think public perception would be that I uh, had a, a, a particular interest in, in the organisation which is applying. So, uh, Councillor Driver. Same items here. I've also been volunteering for food train, um, uh, so therefore I will declare an interest uh, in that, that particular item and leave the room. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've also got uh, John Martin wishing to speak. Thanks, Chair. I've got to declare an interest in item 15 in which a local businessman is friend of, is a family friend of some of my family like. So I will, I will be leaving the meeting when item 15 comes up. Uh, Councillor James. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, also, item 15, I'm working on a different uh, community asset transfer, but um, some of the um, issues that will be debated today are, are relevant, and whilst I do have a sort of political view on this, I, I won't, wouldn't like to express it today. Thank you. Um, I think, Councillor Lieber, I think you have a declaration of interest as well, <laughs> which is similar to mine. I don't see him on the... On the <laughs> is, is, is he put it on the chat, has he? Right, I don't see him on the chat. Okay, I've got Councillor Nicholson as well. 
Thank you. I've been a, a supporter and supportive of the food train for many, many years, but I don't think that excludes me from the meeting, so I won't be staying in. Yeah. And we also have a declaration of interest from uh, Councillor McGregor, who has... Oh, Jeff is on the wrong chat. <laughs> That's fine, I'll let him come back. Uh, Councillor McGregor has put on chat that she has a declaration of interest in item five. Due to her COSLA role, she's involved in discussions at a national level on finance, but she doesn't feel that's necessary to make her, to require her to, to leave the meeting. And uh, Councillor Dreiber, uh, sorry, Councillor Drysdale wishes to speak Thank also. You, Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to declare an interest in item number 15 as well. Uh, I too have been working for the food train during the COVID pandemic and therefore will leave the room during this item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that uh, Jane Maitland says that Andrew Wood is trying to uh, join the meeting. Right. I, can we assume that I don't know where Jeff has put his his uh, declaration, but uh, I think we better monitor that as well because I know that his, yeah, that was his intention. Was to, his declaration is the same as mine? That he, he's in a similar. We'll position. make sure that's recorded later. Thanks. Okay. Um, Sorry, can we switch devices off because we're getting a bit of feedback? Uh, okay, can we then move on to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of July? Is that agreed? Moving on therefore to item four uh, on COVID restart, recovery and renewal. Uh, this report provides updates on the delivery of the Dumfries and Galloway Renewal and Recovery Action Plan and seeks the approval, seeks approval in relation to the restart of leisure services. I'm sure before we start, we all wish to thank our teachers and all the other staff, parents and pupils for their considerable efforts in making the restart of school education as smooth as possible, uh, despite problems with wind and water affecting some schools. The Economy and Resources Committee will receive a report on the programme and timetable for the reopening of council offices across the region. I understand that progress is also being made in relation to members' accommodation and that the headquarters will be able to be opened on Mondays to Thursdays from next week. Uh, and our thanks go to the property and estates and facilities management teams who are working hard to make this happen. Government advice remains that working from home for staff and members is the default position but as we return to more normal operations, it is important that there is access to business support facilities. The restart of leisure facilities is a further important step in supporting people's well-being, and the proposals outlined in the report are very welcome progress. Richard Greveson is available on Teams to assist any member with questions, uh, and I'll open the meeting to uh, members' debate. Um, right, I've got John, uh, Councillor Young. And Councillor Levy. Okay, thank you, Leader, and thank you, Richard, for such a comprehensive report. In my opinion, however, item 3.8.21 on page 21, on page 29, sorry, should not be part of this agenda item. Although I've been assured Castle Douglas Swimming Pool will open with reduced capacity, I still question why the need for a £500,000 upgrade has been highlighted here. And in particular, the implication that Castle Douglas people can simply use the pool at Kakubri. Kakubri swimming pool is not a council run facility. And perhaps being a bit flippant, I suppose it's a bit like stating, let's not spend £20 million upgrading DG1. I'm sure the police folk can just use the facilities at Bannatyne's gym. But I would like to assure the people of Castle Douglas that I'll do my utmost for this upgrade to the swimming pool to go ahead and for Castle Douglas Swimming Pool to remain open. Thank you. Richard, do you want to make any comment on that, on the castle situation regarding Castle Douglas? Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you, Councillor Young. Uh, only to confirm that, uh, that, that the paragraph is, is inserted in the context of uh, uh, recognising the significant uh, increase uh, in financial challenges and, uh, and the fact that they will need to undertake a very detailed assessment of provision moving forward uh, across the whole region. Uh, and this is an example of the, the, the size and scale of challenges that we'll face, Chair. But uh, I take on board uh, Councillor Young's uh, points. 
Thank you. I've got Councillor Lever, though. I'm not sure whether that actually refers to the other things. Councillor Lever. Yeah, it was just to uh, declare an interest previously. Yes, I made sure that that was, rec uh, uh, that was recorded. I've got uh, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Leader. Um, interest in report, and obviously I'm, I'm interested, one of the main issues is obviously the restarting the leisure. Obviously, the costs are fairly high. We're looking at reduced capacity if, we, if the restart does take place. What, I, what I've got concerns about, obviously, a number of people who are maybe using a DG1, a number of these leisure facilities at a period of time, there's been a complete culture change with people. Uh, they've been buying cycles, they've been out walking, using core paths, using a um, number of paths and, and, and walkways around Dumfries and Galloway. And I've noticed a change. There's some, I have some, seen some interesting characters on bicycles, and, and I welcome that. But uh, I, I think we need, I'm just wondering, do we need all these services through the leisure services? Uh, obviously, if there are going to be a, a reduced capacity. And the question I need to ask Richard is, um, has there been done any evaluation on the survey done on the DG1 of the users? Are they likely to come back? Are they, are they likely to come back and reduce capacity? Are they likely to pay the membership? What's the views there? Is there any sort of survey has been put out uh, region-wide to see what the users want and are they prepared to come back? Because I've spoken to a number of people who are not prepared to come back. They've changed the style of, of healthy well-being, as in walking and cycling. So there's a number of people there out there. Are we going to get the income generated uh, as forecast, obviously uh, reduced capacity is going to be difficult. So what I want to know, what survey has been done region-wide? Richard, thank you. Uh, Richard. Uh, through you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Um, certainly the, the issue of behavioural change is something that uh, we absolutely need to take cognizance of, and we'll do that as part of the uh, renew uh, and recovery assessment process um, uh, moving forward as we bring back uh, with members of approval and agreement, uh, options for, for, for restart and the continuation of leisure in future financial years. The answer to the, the question in regard to contacting our existing customer base is yes, we have reached out to each uh, of our members uh, and we're, we're currently on have a survey ongoing at present. Uh, early indications are that there is a, a healthy positive response in terms of those that have, have, have responded so far, that they will come back and use the facilities. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that process is ongoing, it's not finished yet, but we will build that into the assessment moving forward. Thanks. Uh, did you want back? Uh, th thanks, Leader Richard. Maybe, the, maybe the, the, this uh, survey should have been in front of members today. Will this likely to come back to another meeting that members can actually uh, scrutinise and see that the figures are, are actually balancing up? I think there's a report going to come to communities any, uh, anyway on the, the future options for leisure services. Um, do you want to say any further, uh, Richard? Just to, just to confirm, Leader, that yes, we'll make sure that the detail and the results of that survey are included in that report to communities. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Leader. I've, I've got a, a couple of points that I would like to make. Uh, the first one sort of blends into item five. We've got some quite chunky bits of money floating about here. And I'm getting I'm slightly concerned that what we would appear to be doing is almost going through a sort of piecemeal budget process. And I would like a bit of clarity on the position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the council and our services from some of these sums of money. I'm not disputing the fact that we've got to spend it. I would just like to have an impact assessment almost on how this impacts other parts of parts of the council because an ad hoc piecemeal budget set and thing it could very quickly get out of control so I would, I would like to bring that up the next thing is when we go through to the the work is what you do not the place you go aspect of it again I've got slight concerns that um, home working perhaps doesn't suit everyone and I was wondering if we were planning to make home working a requirement for some people or whether it was going to be optional because there's a lot of people it doesn't suit there's people who end up getting like to keep a, a work and home separation uh, so it could lead to sort of mental health problems there could even be cost issues for people as well uh, running electricity at home more and things like that all right maybe save on commuting and blah 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 but i think the staff really need to have a a proper cons consultation about this and I think we need to bear that in mind that it won't be suitable for everyone. 
Thanks, uh, Malcolm. I think your first point is probably more for Paul under the next item. When we're so I think maybe if we can, if you're happy to, uh, to, to return to that when Paul's there and he can discuss more about the, the, the effect on the budget. Uh, Richard, do you wish to say anything about home working? I mean, obviously, it is something which suits people, some people a lot, uh, and other people not very much. So uh, do you uh, want to give some assurance on that in terms of people being able to go out to work should they wish to do so? Yeah, thank, thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, just to give that assurance, I think it's a matter of, of assessment, both in terms of, of service need, uh, but also the individual's uh, prefer, uh, preference and, and, uh, and, and picking up all of the, the mental health and wellbeing issues and supporting our staff and workforce as raised by, by Councillor Johnson. So, yes, I give those assurances to Leader. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McCammon. Hi, thanks, Leader, and good morning. Um, so I'm just looking at the, just a very quick one, um, just looking for clarification, please, from you, Richard. Um, paragraph 3.8.11 um, states that all members have been frozen with no payments taken since lockdown began. I think lockdown began the 23rd, but I was contacted by a few constituents to say that, you know, for instance, direct debits coming out on the 18th, 19th, a few days prior, um, obviously, they had paid those memberships but didn't get the use of the facilities. So, can you just um, confirm that they will either be reimbursed or they will be credited for that month? Thank you, Richard. Understanding orders. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Yes, I'm not aware of the individual issues as raised, but, but happy to uh, to reach out to you directly to, to, to pick up on those specifics. And of, and of course, if, uh, if that is indeed the case, we'll make sure that, uh, that everybody is treated fairly and, and equitably in that regard. That's great. Thanks. Right, before, just as I know that some councillors think they haven't been seen, we've got uh, uh, Councillor Hagman next and Councillor Carruthers. Somebody's got a phone or something on? Uh, see, Councillor Hagman, Councillor Carruthers, Councillor McComb, Councillor Nicholson, Councillor Scobie, Councillor Wilson and Councillor Davidson on the list at the moment. So we could have uh, Councillor Hagman. Thank you, Leader, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Richard, for the report. And I just wanted to really put on record my thanks to all the staff. I think the point has just been touched on there about the mental health of our staff. Um, and certainly I'm aware that, you know, my inquiries that I send off, I, I do tend to work late into the evening sometimes, and I often get a response from council officers well past office hours. So I just would like to thank all the staff that are going the extra mile. I think it would be important that possibly for future that we get a report with how we are looking after our own staff and taking this forward, because I think it's it's imperative. We need to look after our staff to ensure that we can offer the best services possible to the people of Dumfries and Galloway. Um, I've got a few points, if I may um, ask. Um, the first one is in regards to our winter planning. Now, clearly, it's really important that we take this forward and we've got season the seasonal flu ahead of us. Now, there has in the past been reports that capacity within some of our health centres was not always adequate. And um, going forward with social distancing, vulnerable people, I'm wondering how we as a local authority can support those those partners that we work with and whether there's an opportunity to maybe use some of our council facilities and how are we going to be taking that forward. Um, my second point is just really a thanks because Richard, you have confirmed to me that the table on page 29 um, doesn't include the Merrick's Leisure Centre, one of my local ones, but it will be due to be reopening and thank you for giving me the numbers on that one as well. And my final point is in the appendix, it's really useful to and important that we've got the action plans going ahead. However, can I make a request that in future that we actually have who's taking these forwards, which directorate does it fall under, do we have lead officers, just to ensure that we know exactly who's taking responsibility for which actions on, on our important plans going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Councillor Hagman. Um, 
just to give confirmation that, that yeah, I know my colleagues in, in, in OD and HR are looking at the, the review of the workforce strategy as, as we speak, uh, and uh, um, uh, SLT and corporate management team will be feeding into that process uh, to pick up on that point. So uh, work is certainly ongoing in terms of supporting uh, the, the mental health and well-being of our, of our colleagues and staff. Um, winter planning. Um, yes, just to give members assurance that uh, work has already commenced in terms of uh, what would be our normal and scheduled winter planning arrangements uh, and planning thereof in terms of uh, work on a multi-agency level with our resilience partnership colleagues um, with uh, planning for winter scenario, planning, emergency planning and winter workshops uh, in the diary. Um, and of course, uh, that will be influenced and shaped by the Western Scotland Community Risk Register and our, and our work on a, on, a, on a national level, and also work locally with our community resilience partnerships in, in, in the communities uh, uh, in, across Dumfries and Galloway. Um, I will make sure that the points raised by Councillor Hagman are fed into that process, uh, particularly in relation to, relation to health centres, etc. Yeah, the table referred to is very much just an example um, for members of, of the type of numbers and the, and the restrictions and changes to numbers pre post COVID. It doesn't include each and every every facility and apologies for for confusion in that regard. But uh, each of our current facilities are obviously included uh, within the, the restart uh, and uh, program that uh, that we've tabled. Um, and very much uh, welcome the comments on the action plan. I'll pick that up. The only comment I would make is that what we're very keen to do is to make sure that each of these individual actions are not taken forward by directorates in isolation, but this is very much an integrated one council approach to make sure that we, that we uh, address these issues across the whole of council. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Crothers. Thank you, Leader. I think my, uh, some, some of my uh, probably points or other questions have been, have been touched upon. So just looking at the decision that we're making today, potentially, is, is, is what I'll try and focus on. Now, my understanding uh, from previous discussions uh, in committee and, and, and out with is that I think in September meeting we'll look to see some commitments how we drive forward at September full council. So hopefully that's what we'll see at, at that point. So we'll see what that bears out. But So looking at the decisions we make today, we'll look to above and beyond the, the I think it's the £1.9 million pound that we're spending, beyond what we normally spend on, on leisure and sport, the one, uh, £3.8 million, we're allocating an extra 5 and 33 and I don't think we've got any real issues with that at this moment in time because that's an ongoing thing, but it's it's more the, then, then we remit that to look to, to go to the Communities Committee and that'll have a further discussion looking at objectives, whether it's sports or mod or whatever it may be, and you've touched on that earlier. I've got a bit of an issue in regards to that at this moment in time because I, I feel that if we if we look if we're looking across the council st strategically, and in September we should get a, a report on that to say okay this is the the budget impl implications this is what potentially pri uh, reprioritise in the, in, in the, the face of COVID, whether it's a, a capital investment strategy or whatever it may be whether it's leisure, uh, leisure and sports uh, facilities and, and services that, that we provide I think we need to be looking across the whole council. We've got a fair grasp how COVID's going to affect us over the next six months or so leading up to the, uh, the, the Scottish Parliament elections and whatever budget we receive at, at that point. And I do think uh, that we should be seriously looking at not putting this to, uh, to communities at this moment in time. We should actually be looking to put to see a further paper on the wider aspects commitments that the Council will drive forward uh, over the next six months dealing with COVID. Uh, I think that's certainly something that we, we should be thinking about. Councillor Johnson's already touched on the piecemeal approach and that certainly as a group we felt this is a little bit too piecemeal. Uh, we could ask we're missing opportunities in the wider council. Uh, there's things that we can achieve at, in this, these current circumstances uh, during COVID that we'll never be able to achieve again and there's opportunities here that we may well miss out on so we should be looking at them. So I'm glad that Councillor Johnson also picked up on the homework and I think it's very important and the clarification we got from uh, Richard in regards to that. So for, for some people, uh, absolutely fantastic and, and appreciate that they do work from home, but others, it should be a choice and it should not be uh, compulsory. They have to work from home and we should facilitate that. Just touch on Councillor Young's point, I think very much it, it was good to see the fact that it's been highlighted uh, the, this, the, the Castle Douglas Swimming Pool, but it just is for information only, so we understand the wi wider aspects, so just acknowledge that as well, because that was certainly brought up in, in, in our group meetings. There was a, a, a perception that actually the Council's got to close Castle Douglas today, and I think that's the very last thing we should be doing, and certainly that's the, the approach. So, I mean, that's the bulk of taking into consideration 
the bulk of what our views are as a Conservative group are. So should we actually be putting this to the Communities Committee in the short term or just revisit this uh, and using the Council's wider approach strategically, what we've got to do over the next six months, I think would be a more strategic and better approach, Leader. That would be our proposal. Yeah, but I don't think we need to point out the Communities Committee wouldn't be able to make financial decisions which impacted on other services. They have to they make decisions about their own services from within their own, within their own budget. So anything that was wider than that, I think initially we'd go to finance, procurement, and transformation, uh, and and the full council. Uh, I, I was going to pass over to Richard to, to take up some of the other points as well. Richard. Uh, yeah, thank you, Leader, and um, thank you, Councillor Carruthers. Uh, just to give some assurances in terms of the the, the decisions, the recommendations, decisions member, members are being asked today, uh, which is in ref, in reflect in, in regard to the current financial year uh, and the the increase from, as you say, Councillor Carruthers, the the one nine nine two to the. Uh, to the 2525, which is the, the 533k. That's very much based on the, uh, the sort of ongoing variable costs around staffing and cleaning in the current financial year. Um, to give members some assurance, I, I am in, in uh, ongoing dialogue with, with colleague Paul Garrett in terms of the, the ongoing assessment thereafter. I think it's very important that all options are presented to members for consideration uh, moving forward. Um, which uh, you know, which will, may well have significant financial implications wider uh, to the council. Um, that, uh, that obviously Paul uh, is in, uh, aware of and, and would take cognizance of and make sure that members um, are, are consulted accordingly at the appropriate committee in that in that regard. Uh, but happy to uh, to take any further questions, as a leader. Uh, there's quite a long list of people who are wanting to ask questions. Uh, there's Councillor McComb. Thanks, Leader. I'm looking at page 26, property is accommodation. Do the comments there take account of ongoing requirement for social distancing? I'm thinking in terms of our own independent office, where five members previously worked, and that office is now approved for only two members. Okay, Richard. Uh, my, my apologies, Leader. I, I didn't pick up some of the some of the, the, the specifics around the para. Could I ask Councillor Cohn to repeat the question? I apologise. Yes. The the comments on page twenty six with regard to office accommodation. Do they take account of the ongoing requirement for social distancing? Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, no, the, um, the, 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 the the estate and the work that's been ongoing at the moment uh, has been premised on uh, what's required in terms of the workspace. What we will do is make sure that moving forward, the social distancing requirements are built into that to that model and make sure that that's, that's taken cognizance of, of moving forward. I assume, Richard, there is absolutely no hot desking at the moment. What, what happens, Councillor McComb, is that um, uh, where, where there's a requirement for uh, staff to be in the same building, that they work from that same desk, and then the cleaning regime that we've put in place across the, the whole estate through the, uh, through the, the um, facilities management uh, programme makes sure that each and, every hot, uh, each and every desk is cleaned thereafter. And each worker will have a dedicated workstation, is that correct? That's correct, whilst they're in that building, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Nicholson. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Leader. Just a, a quick thing I would like Richard to take into consideration and take on board about the leisure services when he's, when he's looking at it. I know there's been some comments on it. Uh, I think in this time uh, and previously, this, this council has looked at leisure and sports services and found it one of their priorities and found it has a, a positive impact on the health, physical and mental. And it's been proven in other papers uh, within this uh, meeting that that is the case. So it's not to do, it's, it's about value in communities, it's not about making money, it's not about making profit, it's always been something we were proud to invest in and it's something we should be proud to invest in in the future. It has a very positive impact on individuals and you've seen that in your own wards and your own communities 
And it's not just about individual wards, it's about the whole area of Dunfries and Gala that we, we should be proud about uh, achieving. And it's not something we want to under, undermine in any kind of way. On the um, education, and I'm a, bit, I'm a bit confused sometimes, uh, which isn't unusual in this day and age, but um, the advice that's coming from the, the Scottish Government about the face masks and um, schools. They say, John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon said it was uh, through who advice. Well, it's not about who advice because that is, isn't in what they're saying about uh, in schools. It's about um, different areas. My personal opinion is that children should wear masks, but there should be a clarity about why we're doing that and using masks. And one of the things is that should we be supplying masks to children in schools? I think if it is you know, something we have to do, I think we should be supplying them face masks, uh, not just pupils, uh, teachers, um, all staff. Now, I don't know if teachers and all staff through the health and safety, they, they get them supplied anyway, but they, they should, if they aren't, they should be getting that, and children should be getting that, and I'd like to know what kind of procedures are in place uh, in areas, in schools such as, you've got Northwest Community Campus, which is a mixed age school, it's got uh, communal corridors, communal spaces for all children, and I know there will be um, social distancing and other um, aspects within the school that try to take care of various aspects of uh, the COVID. But just on, it's a, you know, and I, I don't like keep repeating this because it's uh, a good area as well, but there's always a high level of poverty in these areas and whether school children and that should be paying for these masks. Now we know there's a, an argument about what kind of masks and, uh, and what are available, uh, but if you have to pay for masks and you have to pay parents in, uh, in, in them areas have to pay for masks for their children, it could be an additional burden on them. And what and what type of masks are uh, then provided if we are going to provide it, whether disposable masks or whether they are um, other type of masks. And what hygiene measures are being taken to ensure the masks are then used properly on a daily basis. I've, I've mentioned before that to the, to the leader about when it was coming through Italy and they, going through the airport, they said, the other types of masks aren't allowed. It has to be disposable daily masks. And they wouldn't allow it to get on a plane without a disposable mask. So these are the kind of questions that, you know, I would like clarity on and what's being provided because, uh, you know, the, the schools are, if there's been imposed uh, on, on them by the Scottish Government. Thanks. I think uh, I can see Gillian's come on. I think it's probably something that Gillian would be uh, better able to answer than Richard. So I'll pass over to Gillian. Thank you very much, Leader, and good morning, members. Yes, we have a lot of information going out into schools today. We received the information on Wednesday. We have taken on Tuesday. We've taken time to analyse that, and the frequently asked questions will be taken to the trade unions and head teachers today. Simply put, yes, we are providing masks for secondary aged pupils, but we also accept that most pupils will have masks themselves. I'm very keen that we consider this in terms of behaviour change going forward and that these masks are considered as part of school uniform. That position is fully supported by the Dumfries and Galloway Parent Carer Forum Chair so that we're working together to get a joint statement. In terms of the type of mask, I know that there's a lot of discussion regarding the WHO guidance on this. We are having, we've got both disposable and cloth masks in schools. Um, I'm keen that we promote the use of the cloth masks because of our council sustainability agenda and our priority about sustainability. I don't like to see the disposable masks lying around in, on our streets and we should be promoting the use of cloth masks and good washing of these masks during the school day. I'm sure many school councils, as we are already across Scotland, parent councils are working to look at their contribution to this. They may wish to, as they do already with parts of school uniform, consider snoots, 
that pupils seem to quite like those snoods that you can pull up over your nose in school colours and that just becomes part of the school uniform. So I will send members a copy of the frequently asked questions that we're sending to parents tomorrow and I can assure members that we are well prepared with a stack of disposable masks in school offices and with fabric masks for pupils who do not wish to or are unable to bring their own. It's a very, very expensive position to be in in the long term, but we will put this in place immediately and then hope to build more sustainable solutions over the coming weeks. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, and thanks, Joanne, for that. Uh, you know, the reason I'm bringing up disposable masks is that because it you know, obviously a lot of people think they are more hygienic and they're easier. And if you, if you have containers of that for a daily, uh, you know, for people's teachers and that to put them in, uh, then they, they won't pollute, you know, outside either. But the, the thing about disposable masks as well is, and you mentioned about the expense of that, I do know that, um, you know, non-medical disposable masks, and that's what we're talking about here, uh, they carry not only the expense of the mask, but they carry a 20% VAT uh, on, the, on the mask. Um, medical masks don't carry that until October. Uh, I think it finishes VAT holiday, if you want, finishes in October. But the councils pay VAT on it, or is it something we maybe want to, to, to look at? Um, whether there's a procurement basis and a national level through the Scottish Government, how they can do that and then you know, try to recoup the, some of this expense that each council is being uh, made to uh, uh, purchase them. So if, uh, your views on that would be appreciated. Julie? Thank you, Leader. Uh, I have to be honest in terms of the procurement. I'm not sure of the VAT status of the masks that we've bought. Uh, these are masks that were bought some months ago and that we had them in stock because we had we did see this coming, so we were well prepared. But I can get back to you in terms of what our position is regarding the VAT and anything that we think we could do through COSLA to lobby on that matter. Thank you, the only reason I was asking that was because I, you know, I actually bought a box of disposable non-medical uh, masks and they had the VAT on it, uh, but medical ones that buying you don't have the VAT on until October, and unless that's um, pushed forward as well. Thanks, um, Councillor Scobie. Thank you, Chair. This may be directed more to Steve Rogers or Lorna Meehan, and, and maybe no Richard, but maybe Richard can answer. Just in terms of on page 23.3.1, uh, and it's really emerging threats from COVID-19, which may result in localised restrictions. And then it goes on to say the recent outbreaks in Aberdeen and being faced elsewhere in the UK and the rest of the world highlights this. I referred to it at the last meeting, full council meeting, B&Bs and self-catering, and I really don't feel I'm any further forward in terms of the fairness and justice, and that's after representations being made by our MSPs to the, the, the various uh, cabinet ministers on what was made available to businesses that suffered from the close, uh, the close down. This time I've had representations made to me by private gyms and they are reopening and I know that they are also scheduled and I know this report's referring uh, very much on the council but we have private gyms that equally won't be getting open until I think the 14th of September that may be brought forward but they likewise don't feel they have been compensated for their losses and we were looking at the surplus or the 50 million that we was made available for uh, businesses applying for known uh, rate fund and uh, so forth and so on. I just wonder if we're any further forward in that where we perhaps can assist some of the businesses that have been seriously affected by COVID-19 and the lockdown, in particular private gyms where I have had representations made to me. So maybe I, I could get a written answer if Richard is not able to answer from Steve or Lorna on that point. My next point is on page 29 in terms of capital assessment and, and so forth. And it's really to the general uh, thrust of the report in 
some of our lesser facilities very much support what Ronnie says in terms of why we provide these lesser facilities. Uh, perhaps it's maybe socialism coming into play, but uh, it's just on terms of, it says here, informed for each facility on a ward basis. Now, if we're going to open on the 14th, and I'm particularly re referring to the Ryan Centre in this instance, when will we know just exactly what the issue is in each of our wards where we have lesser facilities in terms of the reopening? Because it says here we'll be advised, and we're almost in the 1st of September, so we've got limited time to be advised as ward members. Perhaps Richard could uh, clarify that point or give us an indication as to when ward members will be consulted. Right, thank you. I think um, the private gyms can open from Monday. I think it's the 31st of August it was brought forward by the government, but we're not really in the position to open our facilities quite as early as that because of some of the ongoing health and safety things. But I'll pass over to Richard because he's in a better position to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Scobie. Uh, I'm not aware of, of, of any enhancements over and above the previous information in regard to small businesses, but I will speak with, with colleague Steve Rogers and, and, uh, and, and make sure you get a, a response, Councillor Scobie. Um, in terms of the reopening of leisure facilities, um, we're, we're committed to opening uh, all our sites by the 14th of September, but only if it's safe and, uh, and uh, to do so. Um, and uh, we only recently, from Scottish Government, Sports Scotland and governing bodies, um, got more detailed guidance on leisure reopening um, and we're now reviewing this and indeed uh, are actioning some of the additional requests of us. Um, part of that is around the ventilation uh, issue which is being uh, covered in the report and um, we've had to uh, engage external experts in, in that regard. They are halfway through uh, our leisure estate in terms of their, their assessments and that will be completed I understand by the middle of next week. Um, we're also undertaking some additional works uh, and training in regard to microbiological assessments in our swimming pools that are also required. That needs to happen before our, our lifeguards can then enter the water and do the training that they're required to do. So it's quite a complex, challenging landscape. Um, my commitment to, to Councillor Scobie and indeed all members through you, Leader, is that as soon as we have updated information, um, uh, we will obviously keep uh, ward members updated if we're able to open facilities safe, safely earlier we will and um, if, if because of any unforeseen uh, issues uh, that we come across uh, that we're going to face delays beyond the 14th of September we'll also uh, inform the members as soon as we possibly can but I would hope that uh, that information exchange will start next week when that more detailed uh, ventilation assessments are forthcoming and with us. Thank you. Uh... Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Leader. I just wanted to uh, address a couple of points that have been made up until now. I think on, on leisure facilities, um, you know, we need to remember that there's not just been one behaviour change, there's been several. There's a number of people who are nervous about um, going back into buildings, going back into to exercise, but there's also a number of people who um, actually have used the, the, the sort of spare time that they've been given over the last wee while because they've been able to travel to exercise and so actually want to go back to gyms. Um, and until actually we open, we're not going to know that level of detail of, of, of how every single individual member uh, of, our, of our leisure facilities feel. And I welcome that um, there's been a number been of... A number of um, hopefully it's got... Oh, maybe not. Um, so there's been a number of changes, and I see it at Lockbaben um, looking at how we can utilise other space. I know that that's happening in DG1 as well, and I welcome those changes um, and the flexibility that the officers have shown, and that we will um, look into that in further detail. I do think that the recommendation that's here is not out of sync of how we work as a council. We are working within our current scheme of delegations, and that Communities Committee will continue to keep an eye on, on leisure facilities in the same way that education will continue um, to, to, to look into schools and the continuing guidance and changing guidance that, that comes through as we learn more about coronavirus. Um, so I don't think that actually what Ian Carruthers is trying to suggest we need to do is incompatible with what we're actually doing here. Um, I'm sure there will be changes to a number of services um, and they can be considered either through uh, the, the individual committees or through full council. And uh, so I don't think that, that is incompatible. Just a, another thing that I think we need to, to bear in mind is that I, I hear what people are saying about working from home. Um, but the government advice is still that home working is the default. 
But actually, I do think that we need to, to take care of that behaviour change too. It's not just about working from home, it's actually about flexible working. And I'm sure that there's no one single person who enjoys working from an office five days a week. And I'm sure there's no single person who enjoys working from home five days a week. And actually, it's about getting that balance. Um, and I know that a number of people, as restrictions have changed, are now maybe working from a friend's house one day a week, or they're doing things to keep themselves going, um, but making use of that flexible working. It was here before, and I think that we need to move the conversation to focus on flexible working as a council, rather than just referring to it as home working or working from an office. Because actually, if we move the conversation to flexible working, we'll actually find that we're able to cater for all of our employees, and not just those who, who, who prefer the binary choice of working from an office or working from home. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know if there's anything for Richard to pick up from that. I have to say, I like working from home, but maybe I'm just antisocial. <laughs> Richard. Uh, thank you, Leader. J just to say, in terms of the programming, we we'll absolutely take a, a flexible, innovative and creative approach where we can to, to programming and utilising the space available to meet, I think, what will be a change in demand in terms of uh, customer expectation, but obviously ensure that's aligned and in cognizance with the control measures. So, fully support Councillor Wilson's comments. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Davidson. Thanks, Leader. Uh, it took me a moment to operate the controls there. My apologies. Um, so, to go back to Councillor Scobie's point, certainly the Cabinet Secretary has been written to uh, along the lines that were agreed at the last full council. Um, I, I signed that letter. Uh, so, I'm sure that can be furnished to Councillor Scobie and to um, all members. Um, I wanted to go back to the issues highlighted in paragraphs 3.6, etc., on winter planning. It strikes me that um, the likely to be a significant piece of work um, for us as an organisation, hopefully it's a partnership um, uh, response in, in, in preparation for, I guess, what we hope does not happen um, over the, the course of the winter. Um, but given that this is likely to be something of, of considerable scale and potentially a, 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 a set of operations which will uh, most likely involve additional um, uh, expense for us as a, an authority. Um, I, I, would, I was looking for some reassurance on uh, how developments with this will be reported both to full council and I guess also to the relevant um, service committees as appropriate um, as this work continues to develop. I recognise clearly it will be work in progress but it's obviously um, quite a significant strategic uh, issue for us um, for the whole region um, and for our partners. So just looking for you know, a bit more information on um, how will be kept uh, uh, a pace with um, the developments and thinking over this potential financial um, and other resource implications for us as an authority um, and how we'll be able to track those through um, as we head towards the winter. Clearly hoping that a lot of this will turn out not to be necessary um, but recognising we've got to be prepared for it just in case. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Richard, we seem to have lost the, the video um, uh, but uh, hopefully Richard can, can still hear us and, and can respond, Richard. Uh, I can, Leader. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Um, I think in terms of uh, our response to, to winter planning and programming uh, within the, um, the restart, renew and recovery team, that we have uh, continued to uh, sort of include colleagues within uh, what would be the normal resilience arrangements uh, and be flexible in terms of the resource available to us in that regard across the whole of the, the, the new team and we'll continue to, to do so um, as and when and if we require additional resource uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that uh, I'm confident indeed that uh, through uh, the work with corporate management team and senior leadership team that can be uh, identified and, uh, and uh, brought forward accordingly. Uh, in terms of reporting, um, uh, obviously, the, the, the normal arrangements in terms of uh, resilience and planning would go through Communities Committee. That will continue, um, but I'm more than happy to continue to ensure that members are updated as part of my um, uh, restart, renew and recovery uh, reports as well moving forward. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Hislop. Thank you, Chair. Um, I look forward to the one coming forward on the, that Councillor Scobie raised with regard to when places might open or might not open because of the ventilation. <clears throat> However, uh, we go to the Community Sports Hub and we're looking at £200,000 being allocated over the Community Sports 
hubs. Now, is that just to the ones that have the likes of the 3G pitch, which will need financed? Is it to them all? And there are different models of community or not-for-profit charitable organisations taking forward various aspects of the council facilities. Are they all included in there, or is it just the community sports hub ones? I also had a contact from one community sports hub where a council officer, and I think was right to say, the business model no longer exists because of COVID, right, going forward. But once COVID's passed, it might fall back into it. Um, so if you could just give us an idea on that. And uh, the one, I've got a couple of constituents asking me, does the ice bowl where it says that it's the main pad, will the curling pad be open? Richard. Uh, thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Hislop. Um, in, in terms of the community sports hubs, uh, as members are aware, uh, we've got a range of principal partners who operate facilities uh, on behalf um, of the Council and in partnership with us, um, many of whom have been in con contact with us to express um, uh, concerns around viability without, uh, without uh, a degree of, of, of support in, in, in this, I guess, unprecedented times lost income to date and reduced income moving forward as the influence of physical distancing and other restrictions mean they, they face the same challenges that indeed we do. Um, and of course our council has benefited from the recurring revenue savings where facilities have transferred to the management of, of hub partners. Uh, and if, that, uh, if those partners should no longer be in a position to continue to operate the facilities, um, and then they would come back to council ownership but with, with no revenue budget available. So that was the, 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 the sort of premise and the background of, of, uh, of, of the proposal. Um, at the moment, uh, with the, the, uh, the, the, the work has been uh, to include all of the 10 uh, current uh, community sports hub 3G operators across the region. Um, as well as the other um, facility operating uh, established community sports hubs as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and that would be premised on either uh, a support in terms of the commitment from the 3G partners to uh, establish sinking funds to replace the pitches so that isn't part of the council's uh, liabilities moving forward and or, deed, or indeed a one-off um, annual um, support equivalent to the previous subsidy the council applied to the facility uh, community sports hub uh, partners where, where they operate those those facilities. Um, in terms of wider support, um, obviously, as I said, these, these are principal partners who have reached out to us, us, we've had dialogue with, we've taken a proactive approach with then all of the community sports hubs, but we would obviously be engaging with any other partner across the council uh, to offer support um, where we can in terms of reopening and making sure that that's uh, on an ongoing basis so that it could be sustainable in terms of staff help, support, guidance and expertise. Um, in terms of the ice ball, um, we are currently working with uh, the Dumfries Ice Ball Curling Association. Um, our plans are to, to open that facility, that side of the building, uh, earlier where, where possible. Um, there's some work ongoing to that ice pad at the moment in terms of the uh, some vinyls that are being uh, laid as a partnership arrangement. But if, uh, as and when that, that's complete, then that side of the facility will reopen and our expectation is that that, that will be before uh, the, the main ice pad. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sloan. Thanks, Jim. I'll, I'll start, try and stick to your request for brevity. What I simply want to ask is, when can we hope to see the committee structure back up and running? I know the people out there would like to see all the members that they elected making the decisions and not just a chosen few. Committees will restart next week, Councillor Stone. Restarting from next week. Councillor Campbell. Uh, Dougie Campbell, that is. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Richard, for your, your report. It's, uh, it's excellent and it's, it's very comprehensive. A um, couple of questions, please. In terms of Objective 7 on sustainability and climate change, um, you know, it, it, the Cross Party Working Group um, met last week and we now have a, a draft strategic priority with, with the objectives. 
uh, and hopefully this will affect and influence the, the various work streams that are identified through Objective um, 7. But a particular question, there's mention at 7.2 on page 47 to um, the reduction in grey mileage, which equates to 150,000 miles. And I'm thinking that would it it would be helpful um, as we're trying to respond appropriately to the, the new normal and um, sort of reap the benefits of um, uh, that, that, that we start to monetize what these benefits are. So, you know, what are the fuel savings out of the 150,000 miles? Um, what are the, the staff time savings? Uh, CO2 emissions, etc. Et, et, et and I think this will be important as we work towards our strategic plan. Um, and a, a question specifically in relation to the community planning partnership. Um, there was the intention for a report from the Council to go to community planning partnership back in March in relation to our priority on climate change and for obvious reasons uh, that didn't happen. Um, but I think it's important um, now that we have a specific strategic priority and work streams that we work with our, our partners across the, the region. Are you able to confirm, Richard, um, when that report will be going to the Community Planning Partnership? Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. I should just on just before that on the community planning partnership there's a an incorrect date on 3.4.2 it meets on the 11th of September not the 18th of September so 18th of September is the regional economic partnership so I think the wrong date sneaked in there somewhere but, it's, but anyway I'll put, now pass on to, to Richard. Uh, thank you Leader. thank you Councillor Campbell for your, your positive comments and um, I, I can confirm certainly in terms of the work that we're is ongoing at the moment across the um, the renew and recovery uh, subgroups and indeed the, the the different objectives that sustainability and, and, and tackling climate change uh, are a continued theme um, in addition to objective seven in isolation so um, that that's certainly something that we're keen to take forward uh, and sure is the case and indeed we will make sure that, that in delivering um, objective seven then the established um, uh, working groups and strategic groups will, will be aligned and will we'll support those activities and it will dovetail rather than anything being done in duplication. I think your comments in terms of grey mileage and the work that we've been doing around uh, fleet and transport uh, dovetail really nicely in terms of the review that we've started to, to look at again under the transformation themes um, and making sure that the previously agreed transformation programme is relevant and achievable and deliverable. Uh, I think this is an area where actually we have opportunities to enhance and improve uh, the, the, uh, the initial scope uh, and, and I'll, uh, I'm very pleased to take that forward with colleagues. In terms of the community planning partnership, um, I'll certainly uh, engage with colleagues and, and make sure you have a response on the specifics around uh, the climate change paper. Clearly, um, there is, a, I think, a real opportunity, and apologies for the, the, the mistake in the dates, uh, but the, the community planning um, uh, partnership and indeed the exec group uh, to be presented with uh, opportunities post-COVID um, for us to work in a different way with our community partners and embed and sustain the very uh, very positive and successful measures we've put in place on a, on a permanent arrangement. I think is, as I say, a really exciting opportunity for us, but I will pick up the specifics uh, on climate change and come back to you in that regard, Councillor Campbell. Thanks, Richard, and it's reassuring that someone else gets excited about uh, action on climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor James. Um, thank you, Leader. Um, in May, I contacted the economic cell to ask them if they were thinking about a re restart, particularly concerning town centres. And the sort of reply I was getting was, uh, yeah, don't worry, we've got that covered. And then uh, June came and went, similar answer, July. And then eventually there was uh, talk of a town centre restart plan and uh, being uh, the, the public thinking that was going to be foisted on them. Then it was a retrenchment and then um, I was told, well, we'll liaise with um, others, including councillors and consult. And I believe there was a sort of consultation went on in the, in the high street, but there's been no sort of restart. But fortunately, the town has managed to restart on its, on its own. Um, but back in May, I also put forward the idea that we need to look at local online shopping and um, I put forward measures that could have been implemented um, right then and there to help through the COVID crisis to help trading and um, consumers. But again, I couldn't really gain uh, much traction within the council, not 
not get a good idea, but we, we can't help you at the moment. Um, meanwhile, other areas have um, been able to do this, and I've just seen the other day Argyle um, is backing this with money that they've got from the Scottish uh, Government, Scottish Towns Partnership, um, Stirling, similar initiative. Um, traders in the town that we surveyed at the time are asking me, well, what are we, what are we doing? Um, there are other routes forward than, than working with the council, but um, you know, rather than just saying, oh, it's a good idea in principle, um, you will think about it. If they could just say, no, we're not interested, go away, do this with somebody else, that, that would um, be more helpful. But I wonder, given that the restart, um, town restart program wasn't really implemented, and now we've just changed its name to recovery, um, whether there are indeed any funds there, because a little would go a long way in this aspect, and whether it's um, you know, cutting down food miles um, and um, contributing to climate change, gender, whatever, the, the reason is for, do, for doing this is there are a lot of good, um, there are a lot of good reasons to, which I won't go into today, but local online shop, shopping with a, a consolidated basket would be a good thing, but if the council is not interested, and could they just reply to maybe us and say, yeah, go a different direction, please? This is probably more of a question for Steve Rogers, but uh, I'll see if Richard can contribute. Richard. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor James. Certainly the feedback I, I have is that the, the Town Centre um, Restart Programme um, initiative has successfully been positively rolled out and, 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 and received um, well in, in, in the communities. Um, I will uh, certainly speak with colleagues and make sure Councillor James gets a more detailed response. On the, on the, just on the, on the rollout of the restart programme, I mean, I, I, uh, I tried to follow this and said, OK, um, when is it, it going to be implemented? And I was told, well, OK, we did a consultation. We're now going to formulate some sort of policies and strategies, and then you will be consulted. And then, since then, um, radio silence. So if it has been rolled out, I haven't really seen what it is, and I, I certainly wasn't um, consulted much, although I'd actually tried to engage with this um, since since May, because I thought it would be a thing we'd have to do, but I um, mean, yeah. So we've renamed it, solved the problem by saying it's about recovery now, because we we failed to to restart, in my opinion. But I'm much more concerned about how to to, to go forward with this um, online shopping, which is a really good thing. Um, and if the, if the council is definitely not interested, then please tell me we're definitely not interested. But I would like to know if there are any way to actually seed funds, because the town could then apply into those. Um, funds and um, and move that project forward. Can I suggest you take this up with Steve Rogers? It's not really in... in no, well, I've, I've try, I, I have actually tried doing that, and no, that's why I'd like to Excuse me, don't just talk over me, please, Councillor James. And this, this is... We're looking particularly at leisure restart. Now, if you've got particular questions, and as far as I'm aware, the town centre uh, uh, project hasn't been renamed. It certainly hasn't been renamed in Dumfries. So I don't know why other members look a bit blank about it. So I don't know why it would be renamed in Castle Douglas, but maybe it has been. But can I suggest you take it up with uh, Steve uh, uh, Rogers as it is within his remit rather than Richard's. Uh, Councillor McKee. Hi, thanks, Chair. Just two, two quickies. Is uh, DG1, is it only the main pool you're talking about opening, uh, movable floor ones being left at the present time? And the other matter was uh, on shielding. I know of a few people who have used this uh, facility during the, the lockdown and they were very appreciative of the support they got from staff. So I'd just like to pass on their thanks to the staff for the, the service they gave to those people. Thanks. Uh, Richard, the, the other pools in DG1. Yep. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor McKee. Um, no, it will be the, it, all of the pools, Councillor McKee. There is some current uh, capital remedial works ongoing to the leisure water at the moment, but we, we're receiving uh, daily updates. Uh, and, but uh, uh, our plan is to open all of the pools uh, in, uh, at the same time. And I will pass on your very co positive comments to colleagues in the shielding team who have done a fantastic job. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Leader. If we're moving to the recommendations, it's quite happy to, to, to present my thoughts on, on what I was saying earlier, if that's OK. So, uh, the reason I was trying to put the full council was because we feel it's very important. That, so, leisure, sports facilities, uh, service is very, very important. Certainly, to the, I know the wider council and the Conservative group as well. So, we do support them uh, uh, fully. We're one of the, I think, my understanding is one of the four local authorities still deliver that in house, particular across the 32 across Scotland, that is. So, if that's the case, uh, we, we have a greater de degree of control, I would say, over what we do, how we, how, we, how we get things done. But where I was trying to get to in regards to bringing it back to full council, I certainly won't die in a ditch over this because I expect to see the commitments in September who can revisit at that point either way. 
So, in the integration joint board, as you're probably aware, uh, uh, leader, but I know certainly the chair of the IGB is that we talk about social prescribing. It's, it's public health is led by uh, NHS and Free St. Gallen in particular, so there's obvious links there uh, through the integration joint board, the health social care partnership, through social uh, uh, prescribing. There's a number of different aspects in which we could start to address what we're looking to look at through the Communities Committee. So there is a bigger picture here, and that's what we are, we think this is important. Let's get on top of it now. It's not just about making a, a political comment or, or stunts, as sometimes referred to. This is let's take a strategic overview. Let's get all our partnership bodies involved. So, I mean, we won't die in a ditch over the full council or communities committee because community, communities committee clearly does have a, a, have a, a role to play. But ultimately, we will look to revisit this at, uh, in September when we see the commitments coming forward. Either way, because it is a bigger picture, and it, this is one aspect. There's a lot more in regards to the services that we deliver as a council uh, over the next six months in particular, le leading up to the, the, the Scottish Parliament elections. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that there's a, re a report coming back in September. I mean, we will be looking at the council plan and uh, the, you know, what, how the plan, council plan has to be altered by what's happened, but I don't know that there's a report coming back in September, Richard, is there, in terms of the future of leisure services? Uh, sorry, Leader. Um, certainly, in, in terms of the, the recommendations in the report and the, the updates, uh, we'll be taking a paper on the assessment, the review and the assessment back to the Communities Committee um, uh, as soon as possible, but uh, uh, happy to provide updates further in September in general terms, but uh, no more than that, Leader, in the, at this stage. Yeah, because I think the first meeting of communities is the 1st of October, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I'm aware. I've also got Malcolm Johnson, but I'll bring Councillor Ferguson in on this point. Um, just uh, two things uh, on that, Leader. Uh, absolutely, Communities Committee will work, work within the budget we're given unless we come back and request otherwise. So that's the assurance. Um, that's the right way to do it, Ian, and I think everybody is aware of that. With regard to social prescribing, um, I know that there's uh, a decided change in the way the NHS and uh, public health are looking at uh, because they've seen the benefits of some of the exercise stuff already and there are papers um, um, getting put together as, as we speak for forthcoming IGB and uh, health board meetings. So um, I think it's a case of a wee bit of time here. Nobody will really know what the effect of social prescribing will be um, and there's a bit of work there. I would suggest we work with the local GPs and uh, everyone else to fully embrace uh, the, 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 the concept. So, but yes, it's very much on the agenda. Okay, I'll take Councillor Johnson and then we move on to the recommendations. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Leader. I think you can just move straight on to the recommendations uh, in view of what was said earlier. I'll take up my question directly with the officer. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, okay, if we can proceed to the recommendations. Are we prepared to agree one, which is the restart arrangements? Great. Uh, also, uh, agree to the enhanced sports hub arrangements and the allocation of a one-off financial contribution of 200k. Councillor Carruthers. So, so it's no, we haven't got, going back to the, the position that I put forward, we haven't got any, any, any difference of opinion, I don't think, for yourselves and recommendations about in front of us, but I just, to make it clear, my understanding was that we would see the, the commitments for the administration coming forward again in September, that was my understanding, maybe we can pick that up offline, but if not, we'll use the mechanisms. No, no, as, no, as no we're, we're not in a position to make budget, uh, a budget discussion at the moment because we still don't know the full implications of, of, of COVID-19. I mean, we'll, there will be discussions around the budget, but the budget process is going, well, by, it's forced to be different this coming year because uh, obviously we've had a whole lot of expenditure that we had expected uh, and we're not anticipating that we will get our budget from the Scottish Government and into the, until into the new year so you know we're still in, in a position but some, some of that I mean if you want to raise some of this issue with Paul on the next under the next um, item which is on the financial update then um, that might be the most appropriate pl place to do it. Thanks for the clarity in regards to the, yeah. the commitments leader so we'll take a, a, a separate route for that as a group. Yeah. Uh, so we agree to the allocation of the community sports hubs. Okay, and we note the status up updates. Okay, grand. So the next item is on the financial implications of COVID. Uh, this report provides members with a further update on the main financial implications for the council associated with COVID-19 in the context of the council's overall financial monitoring position for the current financial year. 
It's clearly an enormous challenge to monitor the additional costs and loss of income due to COVID and the longer term implications at national and local level are so uncertain at the moment, which unfortunately means we are not able to implement our usual budget development programme. Uh, Paul Garrett is available on Teams to assist members with any questions. So I invite questions and I have Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Leader. Um, I think, you know, just thank you to officers for what is a comprehensive report on what is essentially a moving feast on a daily basis, um, you know, with the number of um, initiatives that are came from both the UK and Scottish governments and uh, subsequent consequentials. I think particularly in relation to the, the budget timeline, it's important to note that obviously um, who knows what the financial implications are going to be and that actually I would suggest that until we have the Chancellor's autumn statement, we won't be in a position to, to try and predict what the financial position will be going forward, um, not just for the next financial year, but, but for, for, for further years. So I, I think particularly on, on the topic of, um, you know, the importance of relevant um, dates and, and how we go forward with next year's budget setting process, until we have that autumn statement, I don't think we're going to be in a position to, to have robust um, conversations about what the council budget will be like going forward. Okay, um, I don't know that, that, that that's more of a comment, I think, rather than a question. I've got Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chairman, I addressed the issue uh, that, that I felt was appropriate under the last item, but again on this item, uh, under 3.7 in the, the, the boxes there, it does refer to the 50 million, and I just wondered if uh, Paul was able to give us any update in terms of our representation uh, to Scottish Government to uh, use the surplus as a discretionary grant within the Council. Uh, again, in 3.11, the level of additional funding support that Dumfries and Galloway will receive, uh, and it goes on to say, exceed any further funding support being provided by the UK and Scottish Governments. And we did get a notice or, or, or an update from COSLA, where Councillor, and I hope I get this name right, Everson, and I know I've got the second one right, and Councillor McGregor were making representation to the Scottish Government in terms of the need for local governments to get the money. I wonder if Councillor McGregor, through you, Chair, uh, is able to give us an update on, on, on that in terms of the representation that COSLA is making uh, with her being the spokesperson on financial issues. I'll ask uh, Paul to uh, come back first with a point on particularly on the remainder of the business support grant that we were hoping to be able to use for a discretionary fund. Paul, has there been any, any progress on that at all? Thanks, Leader. That's an issue that's uh, still subject to ongoing discussion between Cosland and the Scottish Government. My understanding is the most recent indications from the, the Scottish Government is that it's unlikely to be made available for general use by Council, but I understand those discussions are ongoing. Uh, just coming back to, to I think Willie's initial point regarding the, the gap between the, the cost being incurred by the Council and the, the funding uh, received to date. In the report reflected a, a £2.5 million gap at this stage, we identified other areas of government support that may be made, made available as the year progresses. One update on that is that there is a paper going to uh, cause the leaders tomorrow where £49 million consequentials that have been made available to Scotland are proposed to be allocated to local government through the same uh, distribution mechanism as used for the, the, the £155 million that's identified at paragraph 3.7. Anticipate that this council will receive just under one and a half million pounds from that further allocation. So that will further reduce the funding gap that we're reflecting in this report. We're also anticipating that a loss of income scheme, which is still subject to development, will further reduce that funding gap. So obviously these are things that we will continue to monitor closely and bring further updates to members as that information is made available. Thanks. Councillor McGregor, do, do you wish to uh, add anything to that? I think Paul's probably covered the, the majority of what I would have said anyway, and I, and I think just in addition to that, we're also looking at a basket of measures that include some fiscal flexibilities going forward. They would probably be used as a last resort. Obviously, additional funding would be the preference, and the loss of income scheme, which will take another few weeks, I think, to 
fully bed down the detail on that. But as, as Paul said, we have a report going to leaders tomorrow with an update position on our finances at this time. Um, and I would anticipate that there will be additional funding coming to local government in the coming weeks. And we're actually in a fairly positive space with government at the moment and a lot of good joint working going on around the loss of income scheme and the fiscal flexibility. So happy. Paul will obviously update um, members after tomorrow's leaders meeting because I think that will make a significant difference to council's budget. But thank you. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Councillor Scobie, you went back in? Yeah, if I could, Chair. Uh, and I hear what Paul uh, said in terms of uh, the £2.5 million uh, shortfall in, in our budget. And it's just to the point that Ronnie made earlier in terms of, of, of even the, the masks that, that, that uh, school uh, pupils have to wear. And that could have a, 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 an added expense to the Council. And it's directives coming from the Scottish Government. And while Paul and, and both Gail were uh, positive in terms of being in, in a positive place with the discussions that are ongoing, I would hope that Kostler will have a strong voice tomorrow in making the case for local government and that uh, the Scottish government, the SNP government, do step up to the plate and meet the, re the, the responsibilities that they are imposing on uh, local government. Thanks, that's more of a, the one million is not going to wipe out the two and a half. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, Councillor McGregor has heard your point, and uh, yeah, that uh, and Councillor Davidson, who obviously will be attending on our behalf, will be attending the leaders' meeting tomorrow. Uh, Councillor Hislop. Chair, it's going back to sort of future years and budget processes and stuff like that. A note in 3.19, it quite clearly says it is difficult to predict. It doesn't say it's impossible. Um, and I think there's an old adage, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Now, I don't think Mr. Garrett and his team are sitting twiddling their thumbs. They will be looking at various scenarios. I would think COSLA are doing the same because if we don't get figures until January, we could be looking at a cliff edge here. Now, we need to be able to work up proposals going forward from now until budget day to actually allow us as a council to take things forward. There must be some indication. You know, we'll not hold you to it. We'll not hold the government to it. I don't think we could because it is difficult. But are we looking at additional savings to be met? Um, you know, even if the government could get from the UK government a heads up, I don't know if that's available. Look, are we looking at fiscal uh, constraints again or are we looking at possible relaxation it might be taxation that goes up to allow us to uh, cover the cost but we need some indication because we need to be prepared for this uh, you know I don't want to be sitting on the 14th of February working out a budget for the 15th I don't think that would be fair to anybody here and it wouldn't be fair to any of the uh, people in Dumfries and Galloway so is there any work and is there any high-level figures that either COSLA are working on or the Scottish Government might not want to share just now because they're still not sure of them, but is there anything there so that we could get some comfort that somebody is looking at this just now? I think, I think you can be assured that we won't be working on the budget on the 14th of February for the 15th of February. And in fact, uh, 3.11 does actually indicate a number of ways in which some of the shortfall could be covered, and that will be a decision for, the, for elected members just to... You know, uh, what measures we want to take. We also have a number of savings options which we, we considered last year but which weren't implemented and those will still stand. There's been consultation on those so we will have to uh, return to some of those if we, uh, we may have to return to some of those to re reconsider whether we want to implement them. But I'll, I'll uh, pass over to Paul and he'll be able to indicate more. I know that Adam also has been doing some work on, on the budget timetable as well. So, but Paul. Thanks, Leda. As Councillor Hislop says, it is really important that we are looking beyond the current financial year, and that's what the, the final sections of, of this report uh, refer to. Uh, as Councillor Wilson said earlier, the, the autumn review and the autumn budget statement from UK government will be a key indicator of potential funding settlements going forward, so certainly looking to bring members uh, additional information soon after that announcement. Uh, in terms of, of kind of best estimates, 
at this stage. I think it's important to recognise that the council does have indicative budgets in place in terms of it was a three-year indicative budget that was agreed in February. Uh, what I'm saying in this report is that I don't think we have better information at this stage that would allow us to realistically update those figures. But one of the thing that the kind of main issues that we always need to develop as part of the budget process and what tends to be the main focus of budget process at, at this stage is trying to ensure that when members come to consider the, the budget setting proposals in detail that they have sufficient savings on the table to allow them to do so. Uh, what we're saying in this report is that there's a number of strands, uh, including the transformation process and those previously considered savings that the leader referred to that we're looking at at the minute and we intend to come back to members in December with, with details of savings available from, from those sources. Uh, also, no, we will look to, to develop the budget process uh, as part of that, looking beyond the, the current financial year. Uh, and as uh, Councillor McGregor quite rightly said, it, it may be that a number of councils need to use what are called fiscal flexibilities to support budget setting going forward. I think that potentially provides some opportunity to minimise the impact on services in the immediate term. However, I think it's also important to recognise that the use of those fiscal flexibilities would effectively transfer problems into subsequent years. So I think the, the less we need to use those flexibilities, the better. But it's obviously something we'll need to monitor uh, as the budget process and funding settlements are, are progressed over the coming weeks and months. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Leader. It just comes on the back of what I said uh, on the previous item about how we're allocating sums of money, which I'm, I'm not disputing that we should be allocating them. I'll make that clear. I'm happy with that. The, the point is that I think there comes a point through some of this that we need to stop and pause for breath in case we start to lose, lose control of the situation. And I, this is quite a high-level report, and I think I, I would appreciate a more detailed approach a report, but maybe I'm just a bit, a bit uh, peculiar like that. But anyway, I think it's important that we do pause for breath. And again, I appreciate that Paul has highlighted, because this was the next thing I was going to ask about, significant risk going forward. And I was immediately curious as to what fix, fiscal flexibilities are, because <laughs> to me it sounds, it sounds like a name potentially for uh, some less than ideal practices. And equally, using up all the reserves and the unallocated balances has a risk as well and I'm, I'm pleased that Paul's highlighting that but I'd like to be just what are fiscal flexibilities? Paul. Thank you. Yes, fiscal flexibilities are issues that are being considered at the moment because of the extent of the financial challenge that are fa is facing a number of councils at the minute in terms of balancing their budget both in the current year and uh, in the upcoming financial year. Effectively, I, mean, I share Councillor Johnson's concern regarding the, the potential use of these tools, because that, that's effectively what they are, but the things like uh, taking a, a holiday in terms of PWLB principal repayments, also looking at changing the account and treatment of PFI uh, service charge payments, and also potentially using capital grants to support revenue funding. Now, these are all of the things that, from, I would say, general financial management accounting perspective, we really need to be avoiding. I, I think these are, are effectively almost last resort things because they don't address the, the pressures. What they do is allow councillors to spread them over a longer period. And as I think, as, as Councillor McGregor, McGregor said earlier on, they can't be seen as a substitute additional money, I think it's really important local government continues to work in, in uh, putting the case forward to the Scottish Government to increase the level of genuine additional funding support that's provided to, to offset the need for these fiscal flexibilities. They are tools that some councils may need to use as part of addressing the current very significant challenges that they've got. My hope is that we don't have to use them to any great extent, but it may be that it's one of the tools we have to look towards, depending on how the, the budget process develops. Thanks. Um, Councillor James. Thank you, Leader. Um, you're always telling us that this is an inclusive council, and yet you consistently lock out the biggest party from even the most 
trivial group that you formed last time you had a guillotine on an important appointment uh, just because apparently we need to get home at 4.30. Um, and therefore, your administration just lacks the competence to deal with the scale of the problems. Um, I've listened to you saying we've got um, unpredictable circumstances, unusual. It's not unusual for a local authority to have a lack of money. We knew that big cuts were coming all the time. When I, I came here three years ago, uh, it was obvious to me we were going to have less money each year. And then we had um, a chance to, instead of um, just cutting by salami slices and making things worse every year, we could have uh, said, no, we're going to do things uh, differently. We're going to see forward with some vision to the day when we've got a lot less money but, and take decisions proactively in advance that would get us into business. And had we done that, or had, we would have been in a much better position today. I mean, had we listened to me on uh, DG Enterprise, I knew instantly day one that was a very bad idea. Um, and I also knew the way we were going about our business and our cutting was an extremely bad idea. So we are attempting to be like a Japanese conglomerate, but we only have about 6,000 staff and they have hundreds of thousands. We're doing far too many things. We need to uh, reduce the number of activities that we are doing. We need to get out of stuff, but we need people who actually understand how we're going to do that. Your administration does not have that quality of personnel. I mean, I've seen emails and heard uh, comments about the, the potential closure of Castle House um, uh, swimming pool, for example. And these people seem to be blaming the fact we spent too much money on DG1. But these people voted for DG1 and uh, damn the consequences because they only look at decisions in isolation and think, oh, that's a good idea. We could help someone out in that uh, uh, situation. Therefore, we should allocate money. They never do uh, what Malcolm Johnson is suggesting we do, which is actually think if you uh, spend more money on X, you're going to have less for Y. I mean, uh, Councillor Nicholson is always for spending money on, on every madcap idea, but he never tells us where the savings are uh, going to come from. So we need to have a rethink about we d it's still not too late. We have to react now um, to save ourselves in the future from even worse problems. So we need to divest out of as many things as we can. Like, for example, let's go back to DG1. That would be a classic example. Get that out from us uh, into the um, private sphere or the third sector, both of which would do a much better job than we are doing, instead of having that albatross round our neck for the, the, the future. And we need to revisit the compulsory, no compulsory redundancy um, policy, which is completely unfit for purpose in the current circumstances. There are a whole range of other things we uh, could do, but unless you get some decent personnel on board, you are not going to be able to cope with it. That's always good to hear from the Donald Trump of Dumfries and Galloway Council, isn't it? <laughs> I'm hoping he won't be. Yeah, okay, I'll bring in Councillor Driver on that point. Councillor James forgets one important thing when he mentioned about DG Enterprise when he brought that motion forward, which wasn't seconded, by the way, in that I did inform him that he needed to go through proper process because you couldn't just get rid of DG Enterprise just like that. You have to take a motion forward to full council. He did not follow that up. So the person that wasn't listening was Councillor James. This administration has listened to the people of Dumfries and Galloway, so therefore you keep quiet. Okay, uh, Councillor Carruthers. Thanks so much. I think that was kind of inappropriate there, being honest with you, Leader. But I'll leave that to the side. It's for yourself to react to, to that particular position if Councillor James put that forward. But going back, I suppose the one thing for me, I'd like to put this Paul, uh, question to Paul, and it's probably the, the wider... Uh, unionist arts with it within this, this this meeting. So JL's released their, their figures this, this this week. I think it was a 15.1 billion pounds. Is what we, we receive extra on top of the revenues from UK government. Is what we receive extra in regards to public spend and on top of the, the revenue that the income that we have. So looking at forward, going into the future. So God forbid, I would say, say, say there's a majority SNP government. After, after the next parliament elections in, in Scotland and we go back to an independence uh, referendum and we do get independence in Scotland, what will the impact be on the, on the public spend? If we're looking at this now, what will it actually be at that point in time? We have to do some kind of evaluation in relation to the figures we've just had and that's something that has to either be released today or come forward in the near future. Paul, I suppose that's a difficult one for you to answer. I'm not be, trying to be political towards yourself, just facts and figures I'm looking for in real terms. What impact with that? Is that a 20% reduction in real terms or, or actually more? Paul, are you able to an answer that question? 
Uh, no, I, I obviously I understand what Councillor Crothers is saying regarding the, the detail of the GERS figures uh, announced yesterday in terms of the, the deficit at both the UK and uh, Scotland level. However, trying to project what that might be going forward under a different constitutional arrangement is not something that we've been able to, to get a handle on at this stage. I'm sure, though, that there will be discussion around that going forward, not necessarily just within the Council, but generally it will be a point of debate, I'm sure, given the figures that were released yesterday. Uh, Councillor McComb. Thanks, Leader. Uh, getting back to page 62, the appendix to the report, the, there is a figure, an initial figure given for expenditure on IT and licensing of £150,000. The updated figure is £100,000. Can I ask, does this include the, the licensing costs for the team's meetings we have been participating in over the last number of months? Paul. Yes, uh, my understanding is that we had already incurred costs uh, in advance of this period, which have actually covered uh, the, the requirements during the, the, the COVID period and increased uh, working from home or flexible working. So we have not incurred significant additional costs in, in relation to the use of teams through licensing so far, uh, because we'd already made that investment prior to this period. Uh, in terms of the, the refinement of the, the costings reflected in the appendix, Councillor McComb, we've, we've, we've updated the, the figures to, to reflect a, kind of a more detailed assessment of, of spent to date on IT. Obviously, that's something that we will continue to monitor. Uh, it may be that there's further IT requirements as we go forward, but the figure that's in the report at this stage is, is our best estimate for the current financial year. Thank you, Paul. Paul, is it possible to get a figure for the cost of teams meetings? I'll, I'll, I can certainly have a look into that. I'll speak to colleagues and just see if we can get a bit more detail on the extent of, of any additional costs associated with teams. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Leader. Um, I won't apologise for voting to to spend money today so that we can restart vital public services that so many people across Dumfries and Galway rely on, but do so in a way that protects the wider public health. And I think that in relation to previous points that have been made, there's a number of council staff who are, have went above and beyond during this recent period, and I'm sure that many of them have had sleepless nights on various things that have happened. And I'm sure that those sleepless nights and that going above and beyond will continue for however long we have COVID and indeed beyond. I think that we do need to be clear that this report today does not say that we are at risk of utilising all of our budget pressures funding or utilising all of our reserves. We are not in that financial position. And as um, Councillor McGregor acknowledged earlier on, that there is a further discussion at Causal Leaders tomorrow about further funding that is, is going to come down from UK and Scottish Government, which helps our financial situation. So I think that we need to be very clear that when we are discussing finances in Council, in full council, in, in FPT, wherever that may be, that we are not in a dire, dire, dire financial situation, considering all of the COVID expenditure and the pressure put on our finances as a result of COVID. This report does not say that, and we need to be very, very clear about that. We need to be open and honest with the public about that. Thanks, I think that's more of a, a comment on the discussion, really. I've got Councillor Davidson. And in fact, Leader, um, Councillor Wilson has covered the point, but um, I, I do want to say something as regards rhetoric. Um, I think that um, local authorities and the business of local authorities has actually been in high standing so far as public opinion is concerned, um, in no small part down to the efforts of our staff in what they have done to protect and support our communities um, throughout uh, the pandemic. Um, I mean, we've heard various speakers today doing their level best um, to, uh, to, to to damage the good opinion 
uh, of uh, the, um, the, the the council collectively in the eyes of the the the, 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 the public um, for whatever reason you think best fit. I mean, members of the public are concerned that their children are being sent back to schools that are safe. They're concerned that when we open um, our leisure facilities, that we're doing so in a manner that will protect their health and well-being to the fullest extent of their abilities. Um, they're looking for leadership. Um, I hope members will reflect on that uh, in their conduct in what is, after all, a public meeting. Simply a comment, leader. Thank you. Thanks. I've got Councillor Nicholson, and then I'll proceed to the recommendations after that. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Leader. It's just a, a quick comment. Uh, as I understand, they've been let things lie as they were regarding comments made. I know that some people think you know, the decisions that were made in the past were wrong, but I'm quite proud of the achievements we have had as an administration beforehand. Uh, you know, the minimum uh, wage, clearing up social work in the DG1 mess, investing in youth work, saving uh, lowest paid workers jobs instead of redundancies and investing in public services. So I'm quite proud of that. So thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, can we proceed to the recommendations, which is to note one, two and three, uh, and to agree to the allocation, and we haven't actually discussed this, but uh, uh, of three, uh, 272k for budget pressures on a recurrent basis, uh, and these are with regard to um, the pressures with education to do with additional support for learning and the pressures in social work uh, relating to out-of-region placements. Are you prepared to agree to that? Thanks. Okay, item six is uh, a response to the Par Scottish Parliament's Local Government and Communities Committee. And we need to start by removing delegation from the Finance, Procurement and Transformation Committee so that we discuss it. So we have agreement to do that? Yeah. Uh, the purpose of the report is to agree our response to the Scottish Parliament's Local Government and Community Committee request for views on the impact of COVID-19 on the financial sustainability of local government in Scotland. So this relates a lot to some of the issues we were discussing uh, in, on the previous item. Uh, and Lorna Meehan is uh, available on Teams to assist members with any questions. So can I invite questions on the response or response? Unless Lorna, of course, wants, wishes to say anything before we, we proceed to questions. No. Okay. Any Thank questions? You. Can we, uh, Archie, Councillor Driver? So thanks very much, um, Leader. I think what we've discussed throughout this morning is how important partnership working is with the other public sector bodies and third sector organisations in which we do so. I'm just hoping that uh, within this response that, that that has actually been highlighted as part of the response. I mean, I know it's a local government. Um, uh, response, but I think it's important that we highlight those that good working that we've actually had with our partner agencies in Dumfries and Galloway. So I'm just want to make sure that it is uh, clearly placed in this this response. Lorna, thank you, leader. Um, in relation to question four, we've taken the opportunity to provide information on the. Um, extensive partnership work in the existing Dumfries and Galloway and its importance in terms of the COVID-19 response and that's set out um, at page 76 and 77 of the response reflecting Councillor Driver's request. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Leader. So I, I know one member of our group was, was interested in question number two, so I'll just and the point was raised in regards, does this actually answer the question that was put to us? It seems to be a general uh, everything. I know it refers to a further report that was seen at a previous full council. But that was one point. I just wonder if you comment on that, Lorna, and the other part from my perspective when I read this. I thought it was, it was well put together, well informed and, and good answers. But what do we get from this? What's at the end of it? How will this in potentially influence uh, Scottish Government's spend? How do we see that coming back in real terms? Just if I could, maybe I'll pass over to Lauren in a minute, but um, as it's a, a piece of evidence to go to committee, then the committee will consider it. They may indeed call people in from uh, Dumfries and Galloway Council if they're going to have evidence sessions, and the committee will write up a report which goes to the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government will then have to respo uh, respond to the recommendations of the, of the committee's report. So putting this in, we are, if we can influence the committee, we can then 
maybe influence their recommendations and so on, but this is an early stage of it. By putting in a, 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 our evidence, we're submitting our interest uh, in the committee's inquiry and hopefully they will take on some of the points that we make. Uh, Lorna. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Crothers. Um, in terms of question two, yes, you're correct that we haven't provided a list of least and most and we felt that the question perhaps is misleading. Um, we've indicated there the uh, prioritisation of key services that were retained um, and continued uh, through the emergency response. Um, and, and in addition to the leader's comments about the, the purpose of this, we would hope that alongside that parliamentary process, that this would add weight to the lobbying positions that have been achieved through COSLA and other groups as well. Uh, Councillor Hislop. Thank you, Chair. Um, I remember saying once that when you're asked to go on to telly and do an interview uh, and someone asks you a question, you put over what you want to say, you don't answer the actual question. Have we made sure that we've said what we wanted to say rather than answer the question and giving them the ammunition of what they want us to say? Because is there a hidden agenda here? Well, I, I'll invite Lorna to comment on that. But I, uh, I know a lot of politicians do adopt that attitude towards questions. <laughs> I would hope that the uh, Scottish Parliament Committee, which is a cross-party committee, would be being uh, straightforward in its request for information from, from councils rather than having a hidden agenda. But Lorna may want to comment, Lorna. If helpful, Leader, I think maybe just in response to the points Councillor Hislop made, certainly in question three and question four, we've tried to reflect the... Um, detail and uh, reflecting, I think, some of the national lobbying positions and the local positions that have been taken um, around budgets and sustainable funding and reflecting, indeed, some of the conversation you've had in the earlier item in this agenda. Okay. Uh, Councillor Scobie. Yeah, it's very much touching on what Lorna's saying in, in question four. What can local government sector do in short and long term to manage the financial impact of the crisis. And I just wonder if we have answered the question because I look at economy and business and there's a common thread throughout my questions today in terms of uh, strategic direction and, and the other one is officers ensure the council acted to enable and support local businesses by applying existing resources and services. And I come back to that 50 million because as we move closer to follow or, or, or coming out of follow whether indeed we will see businesses in our community or communities uh, going to the wall and whether we've made a strong enough case in answering that question in terms of what monies we need from the Scottish Government to assist businesses as furlough comes to near or nearer the end uh, and we see businesses not returning, shops not opening. I've referred to, to Jim uh, earlier in being properly compensated. Uh, I just wonder if we've been strong enough in that answer. Uh, I would have liked to have seen, you know, the, 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 that 50 million more of an impact in us having that discretion to use the, the surplus. It certainly could be an opportunity to make mention of the additional, the money, unspent money from the discretionary grants and our, our case for councils uh, retaining that. Uh, we don't mention that specifically in the Absolutely, Chair, and I think that's the point I'm making, that we maybe should be making that in that 50 million to, to further enhance the letter that Rob uh, has written, and, and uh, I await the, the copy of that, uh, so that we are making a strong case for that, whatever the, the, the surplus, uh, the, the shortfall in there was. Yeah, Lorna. Thank you, Leader. Uh, thanks, Councillor Scobie. I think that's a, an important point. Obviously, we've um, discussed the potential decisions at COSLA tomorrow and further lobbying around these issues. So certainly um, we'd seek to uh, make an amendment if members are agreeable to include that lobbying position that's already been set out by COSLA and by this council. Personally, I think that would be a good idea. Um, just ask 
members whether there would be an agreement that we should include something of that nature uh, to reflect our, our case to retain that funding, which was unspent. Okay, I think I agree, I'm not getting any dissent on that. Can we move now to the recommendations? I don't have anybody else indicating I wish to speak. So uh, we, we've noted the request, we've reviewed this, and we agree the draft consultation response, but with the addition that Councillor Scobie has suggested. Okay, thank you. Okay, we we'll move on to item seven, which is the Care Home Assurance Oversight Report. Uh, this is a report for noting. It provides members with information about the governance arrangements for the, for the professional oversight of care homes. Uh, however, uh, Councillor Davidson and I wish to propose an additional recommendation which we hope will achieve the agreement of members. And that is in 2.4 that we recognise that the assurance requirements have placed additional burdens on already pressurised staff and services and congratulate all involved in meeting these challenges so effectively. Uh, Lillian is available on Teams. Uh, do you want to say a few words about your report? Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, just to ad advise members that um, I have had a request for a copy of the letter from the Cabinet Secretary, and uh, following today's committee, I will uh, circulate, circulate that to full council. Um, and that gave the direction for the Care Home Oversight Group to be um, formed and uh, to confirm with members that we continue to meet daily with emergency um, processes in place over um, a weekend uh, where there to be any significant issues within our care homes. So um, I'm hoping the report gives the assurance required uh, to members as requested at the ad hoc committee and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. I've got Councillor Davidson. Thank you, Leader. Um, I thank Lillian for the report um, because it's unfortunate that it, it hadn't been taken at a previous meeting. Of course, we simply ran out of time, as members know. Um, I think it's a very uh, comprehensive and useful update. And it was really simply to second um, uh, your suggestion for an additional recommendation. I do think it's very appropriate that we recognise the additional um, uh, pressures that, that uh, fulfilling these requirements have placed on staff, um, you know, which functions they have um, really discharged admirably, uh, in, in my view. Um, you know, thanks to them and indeed to you as well, William. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, and I don't want to take away from the remarks made by yourself or indeed Councillor Davidson in terms of the work that the care homes have been doing, uh, so be it they're from the private sector. But uh, there is a controversial issue uh, in the Scottish Parliament just now, and I've looked through the document and, and, and I'm finding difficulty in, in finding any reference to it. And this is to the number of patients that were discharged, that we always had a problem in terms of delayed discharge, but we managed to get them out of hospital and into care homes. And it's the statistical detail to how many were tested before they were uh, discharged from hospital into care homes and whether Dumfries and Galloway uh, was affected by that, because there's no indication in the report. There is reference on page 86 to testing the requirements, but not uh, post-COVID lockdown when we did have uh, almost all the delayed discharges put into care homes, wherever that care home may have been, and the 30-mile the uh, restriction lifted. I know, with, you know a colleague of yours within the, the, the Labour group in the Parliament has asked for a police investigation to be enacted, uh, but yet there's no reference in here. Perhaps Lillian could, could indicate whether indeed we were affected in Dumfries and Galloway by the number of uh, patients that were discharged and whether indeed they were uh, COVID, uh, coronavirus tested before they were uh, discharged into homes. I think my understanding from an earlier meeting of the subcommittee was that they were, I think people had two tests, uh, but obviously that didn't happen anyway, but I'm sure Lillian can, can answer that more definitively than I uh, could. Th thank you, Leader. And, and just to confirm, Councillor Scobie, this report is specifically about the Care Home Oversight Group, as re requested by 
the Ad, Ad, Ad Hoc Committee. However, um, the the element of this the uh, legislation that allowed rapid delayed discharge processes to, to come in um, and for folks to be discharged from hospital into care homes, um, a number were not tested and they were not tested because at that point, um, round about the beginning of March, there was not a recognised test available. However, since uh, testing became available, then I can confirm that anyone being discharged from hospital to a care home has been and will continue to be tested. Um, however, th there is that um, aspect, that, that first point when there was a decision made that hospitals had to be emptied to prepare for the first wave of COVID-19. And at that point, um, very early March, there was no test available to um, undertake those within the hospital setting. Um, and as I said, um, within Dumfries and Galloway, whenever a test became available, we have done that for every case. Um, I can report again, as I have done um, in the past to members, that we have unfortunately had 15 deaths in our care homes, um, and and those are some uh, s s some residents who were discharged from hospital during the COVID period. So um, certainly uh, happy to, if if it would be helpful to get some more statistics made available for members. But this report is specifically around the care home oversight group and its function. Thank you, leader. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Scobie? Yeah, Chair, it would have been helpful if it was in the report, in my opinion, but I, I, I take up uh, the, the, what has been offered in the deaths in care homes and a further detail on that, because it does not sound that Dumfries and Galloway may be out of the, the, the uh, scenario of the police investigation, if that ever comes off, or the inquiry that's being conducted just now at the Scottish Parliament, as I understand. So it would be helpful if we were to get that information to us as members. The other one, uh, Chairman, I'll just make reference to is the oversight report that, that Lillian, that we had before us in item seven. And we had a meeting with Gavin and Jeff Hayes of NHS, uh, the four ward members anyway, in Stranra, in terms of post COVID, if and when we actually get out of COVID, uh, and that's to the wraparound nursing care in our homes that is currently being provided uh, in terms of whatever way the NHS are doing it. And I would hope, and I know there is a further report on transforming Wigtonshire to come before us in September, that I would hope that there is a commitment. And we did get uh, some assurance from uh, the Chief Executive of the NHS, that our requests in terms of Stranraer were not unreasonable, and I would hope that the IGB members of this council, uh, and hopefully we can get a meeting with them, do hear that what we are requesting is not unreasonable in terms of post-COVID uh, for uh, nursing, wraparound nursing provision in our two care homes in Stranraer. I think that's really more of a comment than a, a question on the report. I think there is a, a, a wider uh, debate altogether about social care. Uh, you know, after after uh, COVID, there is a much wider debate about social care and uh, the, what sort of provision is available. And I can say, also, I don't like recognise that there is a problem in Stranraer, but there is also a problem in other parts of the region uh, with social care, particularly the Annandale East, the Nestdale region, Annandale North, where you know, there have been problems with uh, having uh, sufficient social care to care for people at home. So I think there is a much wider debate, which we, I'm sure that we will have within uh, the Health and Social Care Partnership on, on the way in which we provide social care. I, I recognise that, the Chair. The Chair would like to come in. Um, I, I think you've just said what I was going to say, Leader, and that uh, it's a much wider issue, and I think Willie's the first to uh, accept that. Um, and he's very passionate, of course, about his own ward, and that's understandable. So, um, uh, just to assurance is that it is most definitely on the agenda for um, the IGB. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Chairman, very much indeed. Um, I'll go back, actually, to the um, to the report in front of us um, and take members to the outset of COVID. Um, we were dealing with 
I think, tired and anxious managers of private businesses. Um, they were dealing with issues literally of life and death in the glare of media and in um, public scrutiny. And these reports here make it quite clear that although they were, I think, filled with trepidation about what was going to be imposed on them, yet extra work, um, that was managed really very well. So I add my congratulations to you, um, uh, Lillian, and to um, the, the whole health and social care partnership with respect to this activity, because what could have been simply terrible and, and was actually very close to being terrible um, um, in terms of the management of our care homes was not. Um, and clearly the report um, recognises that. So my congratulations as well. I think um, this this actually was something that was very well done. Thank, Thank you, Councillor Maitland. Yeah, I think we all we all agree with that. Can we proceed now to the recommendations, which were uh, to note one, two, and three. And I hope that uh, the proposal that we recognise the assurance requirements of place additional burdens on already pressured staff and services, and congratulate all involved in meeting these challenges so effectively. I hope that is uh, agreeable to members as an additional recommendation. Thank you. Leader, can we include in there the care home providers who also, because they're not our staff, so I think we need to recognise the, uh, the, the role they played in this as well. Okay, yeah. Chair, could we just get it clarified that it is an action point that Lillian will provide uh, the, all members with, with, with the detail on the care homes, the deaths, and 15 was 15 yeah, I think she's, uh, Lillian, I think you have committed to doing that. Yeah, I have. Leader yeah. will do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, item eight is uh, the finding of the impact of COVID-19 on young people in Dumfries and Galloway. We agreed at full council in June 2020 that it should be engagement with a number of different groups about the impact of COVID-19 so we can ensure that we are meeting needs going forward. This report presents the findings of uh, the consulta consultation to identify the impact of COVID-19 on young people aged 12 to 25 in Dumfries and Galloway, which will give our council and partners a rich volume of data around young people's views on the impact of COVID-19 on them. The Community Planning Partnership already has a Youth Council coming to our November meeting, so this will be an excellent this opportunity to discuss this research. Now we've got uh, Marie Henrik, uh, Youth Councillor for Abbey Ward and member of the Youth Council Leadership Group, and Hannah Burse, member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Galloway and West Dumfries with us on Teams uh, from another room in this building. Uh, Mary and Hannah, could you say a few words of uh, introduction uh, about this piece of research? Thank you. Hi, Liz Mary. and I have been involved in the consultation to find out the impact of the pandemic throughout, um, on the young people throughout Dumfries and Galloway um, on behalf of the wider Youth Council. We knew already that there were massive differences in the way people felt affected our friend groups and even between the two of us. We've and different highs and lows during lockdown. Um, overall, 537 young people participated over the three weeks of July. We do feel that given the fact that schools were closed for the summer and that we were in the number of participants and the profiles of their age and geographics shows that there was something that young people felt that it was important to do. Um, it's sad to say, but we weren't shocked by the findings confirmed what we and other partner organisations involved in the framework had already suspected. The findings uh, to be more significant are those related to the mental health and well-being of young people, um, whether that's young people being concerned about their own mental health or the mental health of other, other people. Um, this seems to have been made worse by the increase of social media use and the increasing feelings of isolation from friend groups. We also found that while the number of males participating was lower overall. The number who were spending more time engaging with professionals and support organisations online was doubled when compared to females and that maybe moving forward there should be an increased choice for young people in how to get the help that they need. Uh, when we look at the numbers of young people who know where to get information and support, the most interesting findings were the numbers who said they did not feel uh, an issue was relevant to them. Issues such as addiction, homelessness, domestic abuse, 
welfare and benefits all had high rates of responses for the I'm not sure or this isn't relevant to me across all the age groups and localities. However, none of those issues are situations anyone could plan to find themselves in through choice and are things that can affect anyone at any time. We would also like to draw your attention and ask you to take note of the figures outlined at the end of the report for young people with minority identities, care experience, additional support needs and caring responsibilities. Identifying as a minority group doesn't change the issues you're affected by, but it does seem to increase the likelihood of you being affected, specifically in relation to mental health and also concern for others. To finish, we'd like to share with you our own experiences of lockdown. I'm not a fan of change under normal circumstances, and in the initial few weeks of lockdown, eh, uh, I lost my job due to it being shut and was inel ineligible for the furlough scheme due to only beginning an employee a few weeks before. I'd already been going through a difficult time personally and the pressure of finding new work, navigating what welfare benefits I could be entitled to and being unable to attend or volunteer at groups quickly felt like an impossible situation to be in. The only normality and consistency I had was through online youth work services. I take comfort in seeing the familiar faces online and within the youth spaces over the summer. This support helped me to cope with finding a job and figuring everything out. I know the service provided a lifeline for so many young people throughout Galloway West and Priest and I'm thankful for it. For many young people, the time away from friends, family, school and work made them feel lonely and isolated, especially those who had difficult relationships with their families or those that live alone. Um, on the other hand, many people, like myself, became too comfortable with being inside um, than the normal going out and about. I became pretty anxious when leaving the house for any reason, and I know many others felt this way too. These feelings have made the return to school and outside life tough, and even things as real and even as things are reopening and becoming more normal again, many are still finding it challenging to not feel anxious in an everyday setting. Well, th thank you both very much for that. Uh, I hope everybody managed to, to hear adequately because there's a, there was a bit of, I think it's maybe the room, a bit of echo from the room uh, and people were complaining slightly about the, the, the audio, but uh, I hope everybody managed to get the, the main points you were putting over there. And can I ask members maybe to, to uh, make comment and, and to ask questions of you of your experience and of the uh, the, the survey, and I think Mark will answer some of the questions as well. Uh, Ivor. Thank you, Leader. Um, I noticed that we had 537 young people who responded to this. How did they find out about this uh, survey? Were they targeted, or was it something that was easy to find online? Um, the other thing is, you know, I've got two, well, three young people, um, and to be honest, of the three of them, none of them have seemed to actually have much effect. Uh, they're quite happy. They seem to uh, they go out and play. The elder ones meet with their pals outside and sit and have a blether. Uh, they're quite, th nothing seems to actually have affected them. Your base figures for what you were before and what you are now, where did you start from? Because if you take, are you worried about COVID? Well, I think everybody in this room will be worried about COVID and think about it a lot because it affects our daily life. Um, do you worry about it now? Yes, because I didn't know about it previously. So you would expect that to be a 100% answer that you worry about it. Um, and some people aren't worried about it. So it's, do you think social media is actually increasing the concerns uh, that, are, that are out there? And are we actually getting a broad range of people actually coming in in this, or is it people who are actually engaged in this process anyway that we seem to be targeting? Yeah, Mark, do you want to take that one up? Thanks, Leader. Um, 
in, in terms of uh, within the, the report, it outlines a number of organisations who were involved in this consultation. So it was not just a, a council-led consultation. So it included uh, a number of organisations such as LGBT uh, Youth Scotland, uh, Young Carers Project, a number of third sector organisations such as the Cat Strand, the YMCA, the Multicultural Association, and uh, and also police and NHS. So across all of those partners, uh, they, they proactively uh, promoted the, the opportunity to take part in the consultation to young people to ensure that we had a broad mix of that uh, and, and, and a wide range of demographics which are outlined within the, the, the first part of, of the report. Uh, and it should also uh, probably worth mentioning that uh, a number of the questions in this uh, have uh, been used by other local authorities. So collectively as a group of uh, local authorities, a number of us looked at how we could ask the same questions to allow us to benchmark across our local authority areas. And our uh, findings in terms of DMG are comparable with a uh, uh, per head of population with most other local authorities in Scotland. Um, Councillor Ducey. Thank you, Leader, for that, man. So, my question is regarding the 537 responses. That comes as, a, well, approximately 5% of the 10,000 voices. Does that mean that we've got, is this sample large enough for us to commit resources and to look at this as, a, as an accurate voice of the young people in Dupree and Galloway? Mark. Thanks, Lida. Uh, I, I, we, we absolutely take on board the point of uh, being over 500 young people. And, uh, and I think we need to go back to the, uh, to when we done 10,000 voices, it was a year-long consultation project that we had external funding for that employed two dedicated staff to do it. So when we're doing any further consultation and engagement with young people, it's, it's important to recognise 10,000 voices as this has done, but at the same time it's important that uh, you know it's just not feasible uh, to, to do that sort of consultation uh, on a, a regular basis around a range of topics. But the number of around 500 is... Uh, is probably in excess of other consultations that have been done across the region. If you look at the numbers responding to the, the free school meals consultation, the numbers that responded to some of the adult consultations in terms of COVID-19. So, so my uh, professional opinion is that this, this is uh, robust in terms of the fact that we asked young people to, to participate at a time where they were at home as well. So our normal mechanisms for how we would consult and engage with young people within face-to-face uh, -face contact and via schools was not there. So, uh, and again, it's uh, to, to give a, an example, uh, Glasgow City Council's uh, carried out a similar consultation that engaged with 727 young people. So that, that's just a, a, a a comparator in terms of uh, one of the, lar uh, the largest local authority in terms of interest in a few hundred more. Yes, please. I've got a couple of questions. I just thought I would get that one out of the way first. Um, looking at some of the partner organisations that we've we worked for, with to deliver this, a lot of children, a lot of young people won't actually be a part of any of those organisations or won't have any, any contact with them. I know that many of the young people that I've spoke to over the past week that work for work in our hotels, etc. None of them have ever seen sight of this, or none of them are even in contact with these groups. So, have we left behind? How have we accessed and how have we got through to folk that haven't actually connected with these groups? Also, one of my questions is regarding. I've just taken out a straw here. Um, Wigtonshire, we've got the question regarding my future. Fifty-seven point nine percent of the responses have some kind of degree of worry regarding their future, but the other 42.1%, are they positive about their future? Are they neutral? We don't actually have that information here, and I'd be curious to see how that pans out. Mark? So, uh, I'm from Wickham, sir, in the area, so um, the, we didn't break down the survey into like everything that it in was in included. So in the, the survey we compiled, it was region wide, and the figures in the beginning of the report that's a region wide. So it's like I'm not sure, or this I can't remember the exact 
a word thing. But it was like, um, they feel about it okay most of the time, they worry about it some of the time, and they don't worry about it at all, and they were worried about it all of the time. So that kind of, um, what's the word? Oh, it's it's scoring it. Yeah, instead of scoring it, it's all um, that's all there, um, although not broken down to Wigginshire or any of the other localities directly. Um, yeah. And, and probably just building what Hannah's said as well, can just state that uh, in terms of the promotion of this, uh, was it, it was promoted proactively across uh, social media, which most of our young people uh, would uh, in the region would access, uh, including uh, promotion of it uh, on uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and a range of other uh, platforms as well. So, so we absolutely appreciate that uh, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's not got the same weighting as something like Ten Thousand Voices has, but at the point of uh, you know the, the work that's happened nationally in terms of the other consultations which have been carried out by Youth Link Scotland, the Youth Parliament and uh, Young Scott, that the findings of this again uh, reinforce the national surveys and it's worth pointing out that that was why we, we wanted to do this because we felt that we couldn't just rely on the national surveys that would have a higher response rate from the central belt uh, and the youth council uh, wanted to, to do something locally, as did a number of a number of the partners. And I think as well with young people who maybe aren't engaging in some of these organisations, we um, like now that they obviously know about some of these external organisations and obviously the youth council as well. Our contact details and stuff, um, we are able to give to the, those to you to be able to contact us if there is anything. For young people that you think would be relevant. Okay, um, Councillor Hagman. I'll say, uh, Councillor has asked whether there is a lunch break. We'll take the lunch break at the end of this. I don't know whether there's food, but uh, uh, Councillor Hagman. Thank you, Leader. Um, and I just want to start by saying thank you to Abby and Hannah for speaking this morning um, and sharing your really personal experiences of COVID-19. Um, I think I speak for most members here to say that I'm always really impressed at the eloquence of our young people when they come to committee. And also, just to reiterate, this is the first time that we've had a youth council within Dumfries and Galloway. So as the youth council progresses, as it evolves as a as its own entity and organisation, I would hope more and more young people across the region do um, feed in to all the different pieces of work that are being carried forward. And yeah, certainly I've just confirmed, I, I saw it being posted, maybe not quite on TikTok and all the other social media platforms, but certainly across Twitter and Facebook a lot. So um, I would reiterate that, yes, I, I think that the survey was well advertised. Um, I, I don't want to take away from the fact that in the first paragraph, it says that we know that the pandemic is going to have significant impact on young people. Um, and importantly, it will continue to have potential long-term impacts of young people going forward. And I've, I will have some comments that I would like to ask in terms of the next item agenda as we look to how we address that. Um, but I guess I've got a wider point, Leader, and that is, can we ensure that when we're going forward that we look at all the people of Trust and Police and Galloway? Because I, I do believe that, you know, there's there's impacts for parents, there's impacts for working people, there's impacts for unemployed people. And it's not to take away um, from the discussion today in terms of young people, but I would just hope to see that in future we have other other groups coming forward and yeah I would just say I've got first-hand experience both within my family and friends that this has had a significant impact on young people and while we gather more and more data I think it's really important that we acknowledge the power of of this report before us today so thank you. Uh, thanks for that Councillor Hagman just to say that to reiterate what I said introducing the, the topic that the agreement at full council was that it should be engaging with a number of different groups. So this is a piece of work that uh, young people have done, that the Youth Council has done, but we agreed that we would uh, engage with other groups uh, to uh, 
ensure that, that we understand what their needs are going forward as a result of COVID. Uh, Councillor Surtees. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming to our meeting today, you two. Um, brilliant to see you. Um, I've been very impressed with the work of the, the Youth Council, and I've thoroughly enjoyed engaging with, with young people um, across the region and in my own ward. Um, so thank you very much. I, I, I think the um, survey was comprehensive, and I think you've got an excellent return. Um, I mean, surveys, you know, traditionally don't um, get a very high return. So well done for that. And I agree that it was very visible on social media and um, and on council websites and things. Um, I think um, I, I look forward to um, reaching the recommendations because I think the what next question is the main thing is what do we do with the information that we have and it's also good to see that you you've engaged across the region although there are regional differences with engagement um i've got a, a question for you how, how how is it um attending full council by teams and in these strange times is is the, the situation that we find ourselves in um more accessible for young people or do you, would you rather be present in person at a full council meeting? Because I know it sounds like a flippant question, but actually we are learning about um, accessibility through our use of technology um, and meeting. So do you, think, do you think young people respond better to our, our present circumstances? And is there something we can learn from that? OK, I think that's one for Mary and Hannah. Thank you. Um... I do think, I believe that um, for a lot of young people, it is easier to attend meetings online. Um, transport is often an issue and things like that. But at the same time, um, broadband connection and signal and things like that are also become issues as well. So it's kind of a balancing plate where, um, you know, for some people being in person may be better, for some people being online may be better. And it's definitely a difficult one that we'd have to balance up, yeah. And I think as well, like access to devices as well. So, like, say you've got one laptop for the whole household, but your parents or whoever you live with are using it for their work. What's a, like a bigger priority to your family? The income that you're going to get from your parents doing the work, or attending the young person being able to attend a, a meeting or attend school as well. Like, I think. It's a difficult yeah. situation. It's difficult. Some good points you've made, and I hope we take them on board as we move forward. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, it's always good to hear young people with patronising them. Uh, but I'm looking at page 141, and I'm trying to reflect that to the recommendations, and I really don't see them. And that's why I'm saying I hope we're not patronising you, because support for young people to be able to come along to youth services and back into school and back to normality then there's the other part there I think there's a need to be uh, a transitional period for people who are too anxious to leave their houses and we're getting young people to try and return to what could be regarded as a normal and for the two young uh, people Abby and, and Hannah here uh, do you think that the uh, what we've got in place is adequate within the schools and to the wider young people that are out there uh, and also uh, under job schemes to help people get into work where it was just on the radio today saying that we'll reach the highest level of unemployment by the end of the year and I think the hardest hit is going to be the young people uh, and I just wonder in, in terms of the question is is the council and other agencies doing enough to meet the needs of you the young people and that should be in our recommendations in terms of prioritising what you want to see to meet your needs. Are we doing enough within the council and the other agencies to meet your needs? Okay, I mean, you'll, you'll see in the recommendations it will go to the community planning partnership and that will be part of the discussions there as well. But Chair, um, I don't know what's going to it. That's what I'm asking the young people. Yes, Have I know, we prioritised the what their the needs are? I'm going to pass on to the young people now, okay? Uh, Hannah and, and Mary. Yeah, so um, 
I heard the same radios thing this morning um, a few times and um, it was, I think from my memory down, I think it was a third of young people they're predicting to be unemployed by the end of the year. And for me, as being a young person in employment, that's obviously, as I've said earlier, it is quite worrying. And knowing that maybe some of my friends as well. And uh, obviously, I left school about two years ago, so I can't really talk about whether uh, the council's doing enough in schools. But um, work-wise, work um, I would... I'm a bit unsure and I can't really make a comment on that um, at the moment, but yeah. And for schools, I'm personally in sixth year now. Um, my school definitely, I think, is doing enough, but I don't know if that is as widespread as it should be. Um, there is a system that people can go to teachers um, or they can email and it can be a gradual thing of them going back to school. But again, that's just from my own experience. I don't know if it's like that in other schools as well. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Thanks very much, Leader. Um, thanks very much to two of you and Mark uh, for, for what you've given us today. Um, like every good survey, it usually brings up more questions than it does answers. Um, I'm referring to page 137, and it's the. What I'm particularly concerned about is the housing and homelessness support, because it's shown in one in four young people or only one in four young people know where to go to get housing or homelessness support advice. Um, and then I think maybe for me even more worryingly is there's almost 45% or 45 out of every 100 young people don't think it, it's relevant to them. Um, yet physiology tells you, you know, that a safe, secure place is one of the first things that we always aim and strive for. So I think is, is this a, something you would be looking at taking forward, Mark, in, in another piece of work um, to look at what the effect will be as effects of COVID unfold as this goes forward? Because debt will affect housing, um, a whole raft of things. Care experienced young people could affect housing, um, particularly when they reach the end of being um, supported in, in terms of that legislative um, role we have as, as corporate parents. Uh, so I, I think the question really is, you know, are we going to look at housing issues? Are we going to look at housing advice? Um, because yeah. rent, rent arrears for me is going to be a big one um, and it's already getting flagged up for uh, uh, older age groups. So I can't see it being any different for younger age groups. Okay, Mark, can you answer that? Thanks, Leader. Uh, no, I, I think your, your point's well made, Councillor Ferguson. I, the, if members uh, agree to 2.2 around uh, uh, you know, the, taking the position that all council services use, the findings of these, the intention after this is to engage with services specifically around how the, the youth councillors can work with them, uh, where we've identified specific issues in terms of young people not knowing where to get advice or support uh, or uh, you know, not thinking it's an issue with them. So that will also influence the, the Youth Work Services plan going ahead. And, and obviously it will be intrinsically linked with uh, some of our tackling poverty and inequalities work. And it will need to feed into the development of our new uh, tackling poverty strategy that will come back to, to, to Communities Committee and then to full council uh, in, in early 2021. So I think the... the the things are intrinsically linked, but the intention is that should members agree that that would then engage positively with uh, services across the council who are, are already have been very proactive and willing to, to engage uh, with it to make sure that we're dealing with what the, the findings are telling us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Drysdale. Thank you for that. Um, just to say uh, to both of you, young people, Hannah and Mary, thank you very much for coming today to speak so eloquently and for all the work you've done over the last few months. Mark, my question is more directed at yourself. Um, I hope that's acceptable. Um, just talking about the support workers and the youth workers going forward, how is this going to work with the youth services plan, um, bearing in mind with numbers of groups that can meet? Um, a lot of young people have been asking me the question over the last few months, 
will things start up again? You know, is that allowed? Will you have to limit the numbers in groups, for example? And it's just to get a bit of feedback for us as councillors so we can feed that back to our communities. Thank you. And thanks finally again for the work you did with during the communications um, during COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Leader. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the General Youth Work Services, Councillor Jaisal, you may have seen, as well have other members, that yesterday we launched uh, a full programme for September in terms of the restart of Youth Work Services that was agreed at full council on the 27th of uh, July. Uh, they, as part of that uh, restart, we are working within current government guidance, uh, which uh, has allowed us to restart outdoor youth work. Uh, which is not ideal in September, but uh, we're going with it. Uh, and that will provide a seven-day-a-week programme in every one of the four localities uh, across uh, across the region. And, and th I, that information, uh, I, I will arrange for, for uh, Kelly Ross, as the senior worker, to send that information on to members uh, later today. Uh, but also the government have advised that indoor youth work can commence from Monday the 31st of August. However, it was subject to uh, sector guidance uh, and a working group nationally that I'm involved in, and that guidance uh, should be issued over the, the next week. Uh, I've also been acutely aware of the need for us to provide that local guidance and support to our third sector partners that are maybe a bit unsure and a bit on. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, I suppose unsure at how to navigate the, the different guidance that's out nationally, and we are aiming that by the end of day tomorrow to issue specific youth work guidance uh, to our youth work sector in Dumfries and Galloway, taking cognizance of the national guidance uh, to, to ensure that our third sector partners are aware of what they can, they can and can't do within the, the guidance uh, as well. So. The, the, the service will uh, restart outdoors from Monday and then uh, from the 5th of October we intend to move to a full indoor provision that will uh, provide the, the, the same level of provision, albeit with the lower numbers in attendance. However, we understand the sector guidance will uh, permit up to 30 young people uh, at any group at any one time, which we think is acceptable uh, to, to move forward with. That's great. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Leader. Thanks very much, Mark and ladies, for uh, presenting today and coming and take, taking the time out of your diary. It's been really much appreciated. So, so Leader, I just wonder, so see at 2.1, it refers to the, the age demographic here, 12 to 25. The numbers we could see within the report was 16 to 25. I just wonder, have you got, I maybe missed that, Mark, but is, is there wider numbers? And I'll, I'll put that into context. The, there were some concerns in, uh, fr from a group in regards to the level of response, and we've kind of touched on that. So uh, just in there, we've seen, I think it was around 15 or 16,000, I think it maybe was, but, or was it 13,000, sorry, in that, uh, the 16 to 25, but the 12 to 25 could have been wider. So there was con some concerns, but when it comes to the actual decision being made, and you've touched on this earlier, Mark, I agree that the, in 2.2, that is, I agree that all council services use their findings to shape. I just wondered, in regards to your comments and thoughts, uh, my own thoughts is that it would be better to, to use that as the council service used the, the findings to help shape services restart, restarts and our, our transformation programme, rather than just shape it. Would that would that be a material difference that, that would disappoint you or have an effect on? Have you got a particular view on that? I think to help shape the, the restart would be a better way language of putting it. And the figures, like I said, just rather than go over, I think we're, we're ready for lunch now. We're ready to agree these recommendations and move on. So apologies for that. Uh, I was going to move on. We've got Councillor Ducey once back in, and then I was going to go on to the recommendations after after that. Mark, do you want to comment? Uh, there's, there's, on, uh, there's also the, about the recommendation that it should be help shape service service restarts and just to shape restarts. Okay, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. No. Just in terms of the, the first point, in terms of the the, the, the age in the report, the term twelve to twenty five. That is. Uh, what council had agreed previously uh, as the youth work services targeted age range. So most of the, the uh, our, our, everything we put out references the age range to 12 to 25, but sometimes the, the way we target specific groups will be for certain age ranges uh, because obviously we, you know, the, the, the impact on, uh, on anything, whether it be COVID or in another matter, will be potentially different for a, a 20, 21 year old than it would be for a 13 year old. So we are uh, very aware of that. In terms of the language within um, th that recommendation 2.2, I think generally from my perspective, it's about the council agreeing and members agreeing that, uh, that, that 
we, we would work with all services within the council in terms of uh, at the point when they restart to make sure they're taking cognizance of the, the findings uh, that are here and not solely those findings as well because as, as Richard referred to within the restart report at the start of the day where they had done some specific work with uh, users of leisure centres that the idea would be that this is not just taken in isolation but taken in uh, you know, in consideration along with a number of other uh, consultations or surveys that have been uh, used that are service specific as well. Uh, Ronnie, did you want it on that point? Yeah, just on that point. Well, I think the, you know, the word learning is important, but I think the relevance of the youth work to the council and how we approach that is uh, equally important. We have uh, in our policies that the environment, for example, and it's in everything we do, it's embedded in the way we think of how we make decisions. And I think youth work should be embedded in the way we make decisions about it as well. So we, so we don't, you know, we don't make it less of anything or again, part of something. We make it a part, we make it embedded. That's, that sounds quite good, that, doesn't it? I'll carry on with that. Um, we make it part of the council's thinking and all our decision making so it's embedded so I, I think that's a good word okay, thanks councillor nicholson and councillor Giusti. thank you lady i'm sorry i'm being a bit greedy um, i'm looking at page 137 like councillor ferguson was and looking at some of the questions there and the results so i'm guessing that that the, the answer that those results are for the whole age range which you would expect 12 and 13 year olds not ready to have much knowledge on financial and debt support, etc. Can that be broken down further? Could, could I get that offline information like that? And I'll go into specifics offline. Is that possible? Mark? Yeah, uh, for uh, across this, the, the point is that uh, I'd agree that that age range, it's across the whole age range, which can sometimes skew it, but we do have the metadata that, that sits behind that, and we'd be happy to provide that to Councillor Justy or any other member uh, that, that would find that uh, useful. Thanks, Mark. Okay, can we proceed to the recommendations? Are we prepared to endorse the findings of consultation? Okay. Uh, and to agree that we use the findings, and I know Councillor Crothers made a point about help, but I think whether you help or, I think if you say it findings to shaping the services, it doesn't mean to say it's the only thing that's shaping the services. But it is one, you know, I think it's just a question of, of semantics, really. I don't, I, I don't take from that that it's the only thing that will shape our services. It's one of the things which will shape our services, in particular in the context of this piece. Uh, Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, it's just on that point, and uh, uh, I hear what you're saying and, and, and totally endorse what, uh, indeed what you're saying, but it's just on 2.2 .2 in the recommendations, I agree that the Council Services use the findings to shape service restarts and, and our transformation programme that affect young people are engaged with the Youth Council as details in 311. But what I would like, just to add to that, uh, once the, the, the young people have met uh, and the, the Youth Parliament representatives have met, the, the YMSPs, that they come back uh, with something tangible to meet the needs uh, of the young people. I think we need to see what, what we are going to do and, and, and hear from the young people, but come back with something tangible that we know we can deliver. And it, embedded in that, as Ronnie says, we should have every report with, that we are addressing the, the, the needs of the young people. But I think we need to see what, what is tangible and what we can do for the young people once they determine what their needs are. I think that's really an, a part of uh, item 10, actually, is when we get the shared, the shared action plan will be part of that. And I mean, although the shared action plan really precedes COVID, I think we would want to be taking into account the, the, the findings of the survey since then, which needs to influence the way in which we take the shared action plan forward. Okay, are we happy with two? And we can maybe come back to those, those points at uh, item 10. And are we happy to agree that we recommend to the Community Planning Partnership to receive a presentation on the findings? Because obviously this affects more partners than just the council. Okay, thanks very much. It's now, let me see, uh, 33 minutes past one. If we could, uh, Councillor Wilson. Leader, I think it's important to remember there's two young people who's taken voluntary time out of their day and for us to break for lunch and then come back and, and hear them again. I think 
with respect to them and the time that they're, that they're taking out of their day to, to attend this meeting and present these reports, I, I think it would be good to maybe consider the next two reports and then let them um, get on with their day. Yeah, I, the time I, I wasn't aware that they were speaking to the other reports. I thought they were only speaking to this one report. Uh, Mark, Mark can, I, can you just confirm that? I certainly wouldn't want to keep Hannah and Mary hanging around for half an hour uh, if they are speaking to the other reports. I thought it was just this one report that they were speaking to. But maybe you could clarify that for me. Certainly the, the next report in terms of item 9 around mental health support will just be myself. Uh, the intention was that I would present the joint action plan, but uh, both uh, Hannah and uh, Mary would be here in case there was any questions which members wanted to pose to, pose to the young people about myself presenting both reports. Okay, then are members prepared to forego lunch in that case in order to proceed with the business? Okay. I think, I think Graham is probably gone. Um, can we take, yeah, could we possibly take item 10 first so that Mary and Hannah can get away? Okay, so we proceed to item 10. Uh, item 10 is the item to which we referred. Uh, which is developing a shared action plan uh, for Dumfries and Galloway with the Youth Council. Uh, we need to de uh, agree to withdraw delegation from communities. Uh, and the purpose of this report is to consider the development of the shared action plan for Dumfries and Galloway Council and Dumfries and Galloway Youth Council following the joint meeting which was held on the 18th of February 2020. It's appreciated that there has been a time delay, a considerable time delay, uh, as we would hope that the committees and directorates will give this work attention over the coming months to get us back on track, but we'll also take into account the, uh, the findings of our previous item and uh, the, the, the more general effects of the pandemic. Uh, Mark is here to, uh, on team to assist with members, but uh, Mary and uh, Hannah have kindly stayed on in case they have a, uh, any anybody has particular questions to them on in terms of the, the uh, youth council side of the the, 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 the discussion. Um, Councillor Wilson wants to speak to this. Thanks, Lydia. I think, you know, building on the, the previous discussion, that this is going to be a bit of a moving feast, not least because of COVID, but because circumstances always do change. So I appreciate the flexibility from services um, for that. And I'm sure that, um, you know, the, the, the last report that we've just considered and indeed um, young people's views in the future will be taken into account um, as, how, as to how we address this and hopefully at some point um, next year we will be able to have another joint meeting so that we can review um, this plan in more detail but also have that opportunity for the whole council to, to work and speak directly with young people um, and hopefully what will be a post-COVID world but uh, that might still be a hope of course. We had wanted to have a, a joint event on climate change which was going to uh, coincide with the event in Glasgow but unfortunately of course that's all changed but I would still hope that we would be we would be able to do some work together on on climate change. Uh, Mark. Yeah no I, I, I would agree with what Councillor Wilson said and what I've tried to highlight in the the, the report uh, in, in 3.6 is that the context in which we are operating now is, is very different and the discussions that the Youth Council have been having uh, at their meetings are now different as well uh, and uh, but I think what's important within this is that members are not agreeing today in terms of uh, delivering all these actions it's just agreeing that uh, we would consider these within the revised timetable and bring back a report to full council in uh, late 2020 or early 21 uh, and that would, uh, around how the actions can be delivered, uh, if they can be delivered, but also around how some of them maybe may change. But ultimately what was presented to members today was what was agreed at that joint meeting in February this year. Uh, thanks. Uh, Councillor Hagman. Thank you, Leader, and thank you, Mark, for the clarity on that. I've just got one specific question, really, and I, I appreciate we're agreeing the actions going forward. However, one of the additional actions, and it wasn't even put down as an action, um, but was in regards to education and learning on page 261. It was in regards to music tuition and that a commitment had been made to meaningfully involve young people in the development of the new approach. Now, I'm just looking for confirmation that that is going ahead. I was really to ask um, Hannah and Mary if, if they had had any engagement for that. And just to link it back into the previous item that we were discussing on page 136, 
one of the questions on the table there was, I do this more now than I did before, and the highest percentage received on that was music. So music came out as the, the largest percentage that young people were actually engaging with more during COVID-19 and as a result of this survey. So it was just really a simple question to say, have you been involved with the development of this approach? Okay, Mary and Hannah? For me, it was obviously just the meeting that we had with, um, with the self Katie and we had a couple of months ago, maybe. Um, but I've had no... Um, I would no correspondence about that, but I can look into it and get a okay. Yeah, well, no, that, that is uh, that obviously uh, Mary and Hannah are only two of uh, mm -hmm. a number of young people, and each of them are working in different topics. My understanding, and I will get confirmation this, was that Education Services did engage uh, with uh, Regan, who leads the Youth Council work, and that there was young people, but I don't believe it was Mary and Hannah specifically, but I will uh, check that later today and provide you with that confirmation. Okay, thank you, Mark. It's just to say, and thanks also to Hannah, I was in, I'm was i involved with the Dumfries and Galloway Youth Orchestra and the board of the Youth Orchestra had invited Hannah along to ex get her views as a member of our Youth Parliament. So thank you, Hannah, for your input for that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chairman, I'm looking at the action plan and, and it... it I, I, take, I reflect back to the day, and some of us will remember when we had a Rainbow Alliance uh, leading the council as the administration, and we had 25 priority points that meant nothing because there were so many priority points. And I'm looking at, at, at the, the action plan here, and I come back to something that is tangible, and I'm looking at the, some of these, and I'm not wanting to take away from the young people in terms of uh, what they perceive as, uh, as we want this and, and, and so forth and so on, but... I come back that you know we need to be able to deliver on what the young people are, are coming forward with and for us to have something that is tangible that we can work with uh, and I see nothing wrong with some of them I'm picking it maybe one or two learner drivers using council vehicles in the evenings at weekends when they're not being used uh, and, and you know is that tangible is it not tangible when it's not being used I'm sure it will be and then there's improved care and maintenance in public parks make them safer and more accessible I'm just picking it bits and pieces but we need to have you know something that is tangible that we you know rather than a hundred priorities and you know and, and nothing's delivered we need to make sure that we are delivering for the young people and they come back to to meet the needs of those young people and we look at their priorities now there's a fair list here uh, and, and I come back to the two young people is there a way that we can get uh, the young people of Dumfries and Galloway to prioritize something tangible that we know we are delivering for you in terms of your needs. I mean, the, the, these lists were the things which came out of the workshops on, on you know, so, uh, you know, it was bound to be fairly diverse because there was a, fairly, a large number of workshops, but I, I would hope that they, the purpose of the, the Youth Council and, and officers working together is to get to that point where it's tangible things which actually deliver for young people. But I'll hand over to, to Mark and uh, Mary and Hannah to, to comment further. I, I'm just touching on one point, Leader, if that's okay. It's maybe just worth again, refreshing members' minds that within uh, uh, the appendix uh, that it does outline uh, three or four uh, key priorities for each of the service committees. So that, so uh, taking board Councillor Scobie's point, that although there was a long list there, that was capturing the discussion that took place at the, the workshop. But, you know, if you look at two, page 253, an example, it's, it's clear there what the, the three main priorities are for a uh, communities committee uh, that would then report to that and then the other actions are things that we would consider and bring back as part of that further report to full council but in terms of making sure we've got a uh, tangible outcome that the, the, the three or four priorities for each service committee is where we will focus uh, and aim to deliver where possible uh, quite soon uh, to make sure that we've got uh, deliverables that come out of that meeting as opposed to it just being something that gets spoke about so we're very keen i think uh, uh, officer level to make sure that we deliver on these uh, should members agree them uh, and, and confirm them again today. Thanks Mark. I don't see anybody else 
offering to speak, so I will go to the recommendations, which the 2.2 is for noting, and then we're being asked to agree the next steps as I set out in paragraphs 3.8 and 3.9. Are we content to do that? Bearing in mind uh, Councillor Scobie's point that we need to come back with tangible uh, actions which can improve, uh, agreed with the Youth Council, which can improve the, the lot of, of young people in our region. Okay, now it's now quarter to two. Uh, so if we can reconvene at quarter past two, um, give people half an hour to, to get something to eat and so on. And m m before I leave, many thanks to Mary and Hannah for taking the time, as, as uh, Councillor Wilson said, for taking the time out. And you know, you had to wait rather a long time before your items came up, but we're grateful for, uh, to you for doing that. So thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, we're back to item nine, which is the low level mental health support to young people to address the impact of COVID 19. We first of all have to withdraw delegation from the communities committee. So we agreed to do that. Okay. This report seeks member agreement for investment in community based low level mental health support to young people as an effective intervention approach to address the impacts of COVID 19. As we have just seen in research, mental health has been a significant issue for many young people. And it is therefore particularly fortunate that we have a pilot programme in place, which has been evidence as successful, that can be rolled out quickly and easily, and which is cost effective. I'm aware that this pilot is very much a Dumfries and Galloway initiative, and also that other local authorities have expressed an interest in our approach. Uh, Mark Malloy is available on Teams to assist members with any questions, so I uh, invite members to indicate that they wish to speak, and I have Councillor Wilson first. Thank you, Leader, and uh, I fully welcome this um, report today and our commitment to supporting young people's mental health. Uh, in the last report, uh, we can all ask questions about samples and should we, have a, should we have spoken to more young people, but what that report did tell us is that over 20% of all young people that were spoken to um, were feeling some sort of anxiety over their mental health or that their mental health had been affected at this time. So I think it is very important that the evidence that we have in front of that, we act on and put in the resources that are, are necessary. Work in the criminal justice system, I unfortunately see the impact of um, untreated childhood trauma that um, may not um, show an impact, a, a visible impact, after a day, a couple of months. A year it can be years or decades um, in the future and the devastating impact it has um, on that individual and indeed their wider family um, and how actually it is very damaging so I think that this report today and the work that we are doing and in addition to the work carried out by educational psychology colleagues um, in addition to our recovery curriculum in schools um, and in addition to our um, school uh, youth information workers already operating within our schools means that we are avoiding a COVID lost generation rather than waiting for the reports in 5, 10, 20 years telling us that there was a problem and that we didn't put in the necessary resources that were required. Thanks, Councillor Wilson. I've got uh, Councillor Carruthers, Karen Carruthers. Thank you, Leader. Um, Mark, a note from um, page, well, actually, I think it's 160. My numbers seem to have been overwritten by other um, numbers. Um, that in 3.19, um, oh, no, sorry, the full project cost table, that the partnership contribution in year one is 62,500, and there's no contribution in year two or year three compared to the council's whopping um, contribution of 1.3 million. Can I ask why that is the case? Because further in the actual report, it does actually evidence that a lot of these children or youths who are actually um, getting the support would normally be referred on to specialist support. However, after six to 12 weeks sessions, um, they no longer need that support because they have developed the coping strategies themselves. So is there a reason why the partnership organisation is contributing so little towards this? Because surely it's having a positive effect on their referrals. Thanks, uh, Mark. Well, in terms of the, 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 the partnership that has been discussing this is the Children's Services Mental Health Subgroup, uh, which uh, comprises of NHS and Council uh, and, and third sector uh, different services. The, the money that uh, is referred to in terms of the partner co partnership contribution of the 62,500 in year one uh, is in relation to initial funding which has been allocated by the Scottish Government to the partnership. It may be uh, that uh, our understanding is that there will be further funding coming to support uh, mental health support to young people within a community setting uh, which has been discussed uh, at COSLA tomorrow uh, and that there may be further funding that comes from the partnership but the other partners have confirmed at this point in time that within their existing budgets, they are not able to contribute to this. However, they absolutely acknowledge uh, the, the vital role it plays in terms of early intervention. Uh, but what we, uh, 
wanted to do and, and felt was important, which builds on what Councillor Wilson said, is that you know that some other local authorities' approach is to wait till next year, till 21, uh, and then look to put in place a service at the point when other partners, such as the NHS, may be able to contribute towards some costs. So, and we felt very strongly as a partnership that. Uh, it was important that we address that now because we've got the evidence now and we needed to deal with it at an early intervention stage because, and I'll, I'll give members just an example here, where uh, our, the Youth Information Workers in Schools pilot, uh, which was agreed at Education Committee that we would roll out as our school counselling model, the staff have been in the schools now four days and they've had 147 referrals uh, and four days of this being in operation. So that shows you the scale of the, 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 the challenge that we are dealing with, uh, and that's even before our teaching colleagues fully understand the, the impact on young people. But I fully acknowledge that, you know, that the council has been asked to, to do the heavy lifting with this, but uh, that ask is in relation to the evidence that we've got in terms of impact. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. It's okay, Lee, if I come back in with a Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Surely. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, is if we can um, target children at a younger age, of course, you know, um, I, I, like getting them to actually develop their own skills because there's a lot of emphasis um, and awareness nowadays on people's mental health. Um, but there's a clear difference between kind of mental health anxieties to mental illness. Um, and we have to absolutely make sure that 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 difference is differentiated because a lot of input at the early stages of normalizing somebody's anxiety because of like so COVID-19 because at the end of the day there's a lot of people out there regardless of their age that have increased anxiety through COVID-19 um, so I think that it is you know it is very important that if we can actually um, adapt kids to kind of develop their own um, coping strategies obviously that has a positive effect on their adult life. Um, will these positions be filled by existing staff in the redeployment pool? Um, because I do note that the council are saying that we are going to train them up and give them the relevant um, registrations that, that's needed. Um, so, if there is people with skill set, um, will it be? Will they, these positions be taken from there? Uh, Mark. Uh, uh, just in the first point, uh, Councillor Carruthers, um, I, I fully agree in terms of you know the difference between mental illness and and, uh, and the, the low level mental health support. And hopefully, this is what this is outlining to members: is that if we can deal with this at such an early stage, which would stops the the young people requiring that more formal support, uh, that, that you know the, the the greater the impact of the project. And that's where through the pilots that have run for the two years, we've got that evidence based approach and. And the, what we have also worked uh, across the mental health partnership with is that we've now got in place a clear pathway uh, from that low level support where our council services, which are outlined in this paper, are in there as the first tier of support that would hopefully prevent young people needing to move up that uh, pathway. Uh, and, and that work is, is something that uh, you know has been worked on by colleagues for, for probably about a year now. So we've we've got that clear pathway in place of how we deal with this as a low level uh, low level impact in, in mental health. In terms of the uh, your second point uh, there, I, I, you know I think the the two things are, are linked where the we need to uh, utilize the, the staff who've got the transferable skills within the redeployments pool because we've got uh, you know a number of really talented uh, colleagues who, who are within there uh, and but at the same time it's important that they have the same tr the, the transferable skills that we need to deliver this project because it is a specific skill set that uh, that's required to make this a success. So our first protocol will be to uh, to work with human resources in terms of the, the, the talent pool that's there. And then if we're not able to fill all the positions, then we would uh, move to a more open uh, external recruitment. But the first protocol would be internally at the, in the first point, similar to the report that uh, the Chief Social Work Officer brought uh, last month in terms of that early intervention support for young people. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Hackman. Thank you, Leader, and thanks, Mark, for addressing the concerns raised there. Um, just before I go on to my point, there's a phrase, nothing about us without us. 
Um, and it's a shame that we had to take the recess and the young people that were speaking so eloquently previously weren't able to stay because it, it is useful that, and it's important that young people's voices are he heard when we're making decisions about the impacts on their lives. Um, first of all, I just want to welcome the, the approach with that and I'm really pleased that this has been endorsed by the Children's Executive Group. Um, I was just wondering, was there any feedback in terms of the effectiveness of this proposal from that group and was was that any feedback incorporated into the proposal? The reason I ask this is I am very much aware, as I'm sure my colleagues are, some of our services such as CAMS are really highly oversubscribed and staff are struggling to get through the referrals made to them. Um, Again, Mark, you've, you've answered the question in terms about training and certainly within the paper before us today in 3.19, it states that you know our, our staff will be trained to a national standard. So that's really important to acknowledge. Um, and in terms of the one-to-one -one support that's being proposed here, it states that youth workers will be able to refer to that service and young people can self-refer by speaking to the youth information worker. Will there be an opportunity for young people to refer to that service without going through a youth worker, i.e. can they go online, can they can they phone, say the cool to talk phone line? Can you know how can they access these services without having to go through a third party? Thanks, Kim. So sorry, ma'am. It just gives us the first point for the service mental health. The, 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 the proposal in front of members is fully endorsed by all the partners in that, and there's been significant uh, discussion took place with colleagues within the NHS and, uh, and uh, with great support from the Director of Psychology and Head of the Child and Adolescent uh, Mental Health uh, because of the, the impact that, uh, that this will have uh, positively on, on young people. So just to reassure you that, you know, the, the feedback uh, from uh, those members are, are incorporated in this final proposal that's in front of members. In, in terms of the, the referral pathways uh, to it, 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 absolutely it's important that young people who want to refer on to this sort of service without having to go through a teacher or a youth worker can do that knowing um, that it, it can be done in a confidential way because quite often that that's the unique point of youth work is about the young person uh, you know getting involved themselves without having to, to go through a, a, a third party if you like to, to do that or uh, you know including parent and guardian so that the idea would uh, would be that the, uh, as part of the schools project that uh, it started four days ago in terms of direct delivery. From October, uh, we are launching, uh, as part of that, an online portal, which is going to be uh, a, a pathway for young people to be able to refer into this service in a community base, but also into the school services uh, through self-referral without anyone being aware of that. Uh, obviously, with appropriate safeguards there, uh, you know, if there is any safeguard concerns, but uh, generally speaking, that young people would be able to self-refer on, which I think is important for a lot of young people where they're maybe sitting at home and, uh, you know, and uh, their, their parents are thinking that they're OK, but maybe there is some underlying things that they're not, not every young person and child would be able to talk to their parent about. So that pathway has been built into that. Uh, and in terms of the training that, 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 you know, obviously that was very important that the staff uh, are trained up, uh, you know, through COSCA, which is the national body for counselling and psychotherapy. And they would then be trained to, to offer a solution focused counselling approach, which the partnership has agreed is absolutely the, the right uh, approach that we should be taking through this project. Okay, uh, Councillor Levy. Thank you, Leader. Um, this report originally came to uh, um, education in January uh, this year and was very well received. I think it's a very good report and shows how effective uh, uh, this um, project has been. Looking at the, uh, the results on page 290, 1,200 uh, people attended sessions, which is a, a very good result. But what's more interesting as far as I'm concerned is the, the retention rate at 99.6% which is a huge retention rate, and that's actually young people judging how effective this uh, service has been for themselves. So I think uh, it's to congratulate on what's achieved so far. 
and I look forward to uh, what we'll achieve in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks. I think that's uh, a comment ra again rather than a, a question to Mark. But uh, um, uh, Councillor Hislop. Thank you, Leader. Uh, I think I'm coming, coming down to the fact that I feel like we're comparing apples with pears in these reports. Um, the problem I have is when I look at, say, Wallace Hall Academy in the f initial report, um, page... Oh, I can't quite make it out. Those numbers. It's 274, I think. It has uh, well-being wheels on it which show an average of, I would say, about 7.7. .7. And then when you go to the Wallace Hall one, which is page 215, the well-being's then down to about three and a half. Now, I find it difficult to compare the two, but you're using different criteria. So how do we know that the improvement is sustained over the two years if we're looking at different things. Um, you know, we need to be able to say that the baseline figure was here. This has shown that this has been good. This has shown it's been better. Currently, we've changed the rules halfway through and then came out and said, well, we're starting again. We're going from a different base point. Will we see a change again or are we going to keep the same figures going forward? Because when it comes to scrutiny and monitoring it, if you don't have the same baseline figure every year, you can't see if you're actually improving. Or if I was to take a blunt look and say, why have we half the performance? Because we went from seven and a half to three and a half. But I know that there's been change in the actual tool that you've used. We need to keep that the same so that we can monitor it better. I think the well-being tool used in the schools, which is different to the one on page uh, earlier, um, or in some of the schools, seems to be out of five rather than out of ten. I'm not quite sure what, what the difference is, but maybe Mark can explain that. Yeah, thanks, Leader. Yeah, the, the difference uh, that, that Councillor Hislop's pointing out is that in year one of the pilot project, the, the well-being wheel that was used there was a national uh, wheel that, that was used and been used across the, the, the country. However, through the work in the pilot year, our children's services mental health subgroup developed uh, a wheel along with uh, some other local authorities, which we felt captured a greater range of outcomes. So what you will see is that, uh, that there's a greater range of things that are measured in year two. So we absolutely acknowledge that we use that different tool in year one to year two to measure it but we felt that uh, across the whole partnership that that was because in year two we were able to measure a lot more as we had the time to develop it the, the reassurance i can give is that you you can see the sustained change because no young person would stay involved in this project for two years or for 18 months or even even for six months because at that point there's a significant issue if there's not an exit plan for that young person so although you're, you're comparing out of 10 in, in year one and out of five in year two, uh, it, it's different young people that you're working with uh, at that point. So ultimately, it, it is still showing the, the same uh, you know, sustained impact uh, in year one and year two. And the, f the final part of the assurance in terms of the scrutiny is that that wheel that was used in year two of the pilot uh, is the wheel that will be used for the next three years of the school counselling project and we'll also be able to use within the community project. So for the next three years, that will provide us with that more robust data than what we had in year one. Uh, and it will allow us to compare as well between the impact of the project within a school setting and within a community setting. Uh, just for my uh, clarification, when you're looking at the wheels in year two, that is the same cohort of young people at the beginning and at the end, because you did refer to different young people being in it for different periods of time. So when you're looking at one of these uh, well-being evaluations, that is the same cohort of young people? Yeah, so, so within year one, that is, if you like, one cohort of young person where we use the, the, the national well-being wheel that was uh, out of uh, 10. When we then developed it locally uh, over that year's period to provide us with the more robust 
evaluation because we felt that you know for, for the level of investment that this takes financially we needed to, to have a more robust way of measuring it that the, the well-being wheel in year two uh, is the one that will be used for the next three years but it's a different cohort of young people in the year yeah. two pilot from the young people yeah I, no, that, that wasn't actually my question it was actually in the results before the sort of before and after you've got two for example page 215 you've got two wheels for wallace hall and i'm presuming that you're comparing before and after for the same cohort of young people yeah that, that's right Linda, yes okay. so yep. ultimately they, they, they fill out the same question and the same questions are asked uh, at the start of the intervention and then at the end of the intervention which then uh, 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 you know if it, if it, if the interventions work positively should then show a positive output at the end so that's where it refers to the pre and the post yeah thanks uh council driver yeah th <coughs> thanks very much here I'm, I'm, I'm looking at page 206 and 207 mark which is five ways youth work is closing the gap and five reasons to collaborate with youth work and and i'll put my armed forces champions hat on here and say there's potentially an opportunity here to enhance that piece of work, especially in the wider learning and achievement and employability and skills development. So it's, it's maybe an ask more than a question, Leader, to say that perhaps Mark and I can get together to talk about the cadet forces uh, and, and where that can uh, support this, this um, lower mental health issues. I mean, there's eight Army cadet detachments, there's four sea cadet detachments, and there's two or three Air Training Corps detachments in Dumfries and Galloway which I'm sure can enhance the employability and skills with the work that they do because they're actually working with the SQA to ensure that those skills that they get can be transferable. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, Mark, that you and I can get together and talk about uh, that, the potential for that to assist in this, this particular low-level mental health issue. Okay, uh, uh, Mark? Yeah, no, we're happy to pick that up with uh, Councillor Drybra. Uh, over the next week and arrange something to make sure that the the the, uh, the uniform groups are, are involved in that and, and other partners as required. Okay. Councillor Scobie. Thanks, Chair, uh, and I welcome the report as it does focus our minds on what the issues are in terms of young people with particularly mental health uh, issues, poor mental health. And it, it does say in paragraph 3.3 3, uh, and page 158 that uh, the best approach to address the challenge of impact on, of COVID-19, what I see this report is doing is just catch up, playing catch up, because the problems were there pre-COVID-19. And I well remember having a discussion with a head teacher in terms of pri the, the priorities that are listed, one, two, three, four, and I'm not sure what order, I think it even goes to five. And what we were delivering on uh, in most of the secondary schools was priorities if it was at the top. Priorities one and two, where three, four and five tended to drop off the end. But we wanted to deliver the service. So hence why I say I think we're in catch up here, pre-COVID-19. And I look at this uh, and I look at the approach. Uh, within our communities, we will raise awareness of mental health and provide tools to equip communities to support the young people and manage their own mental health to improve outcomes. Listening to what I was saying, and how do you measure? How do you measure success? And we already know that in terms of looked after children, they are low achievers. And, and the records are coming back that they are the ones that tend not to achieve as much uh, as the others. And there's sometimes one that are faced with uh, poor mental health or, or, or low mental health. And I just look at this, and I see here on page 165, in terms of the Youth Inquiry Service, and just listening to Mark there, where he said uh, we, he had 147 referrals within two days. And whether indeed uh, we are putting enough resources into this uh, on the numbers that, that Mark did refer to uh, within the, the two days. And I think back to the budget setting when I argued vehemently against the reduction in additional support for learners and the effect this would have on young people with mental health issues. And we, we continually reduce that additional support for learners budget. And what we're doing is catch up and we're expecting Mark with our, his youth inquiry services to pick up the tab and, and deal with this. So I don't think we are putting enough resources in it, but it's a question that we as members as the elected members have to address 
in terms of are we putting enough resources into this, not just by Mark's uh, youth inquiry services, which will help with the ones uh, that fall away from the one-to-ones and, and the ones with uh, a care plan. We have a lot more in the priorities three, four and five. And I just don't think we're putting enough resources into this. Thanks. Um, I think that again, that's really more of a statement. We have actually agreed today to put some additional or to, to fill a, a, a gap because obviously some of those savings were, were unable to be made and that we've agreed to, to allocate money on a recurring basis in order to fill that. But again, I think it was something... a, sorry, Chair. I, I think it was a question, you know, not of Mark, because I, I wouldn't expect Mark to say anything or other. Uh, but it's a question of all our, uh, the members here. Are we putting, even with the money that you're talking about or referring to, are we putting enough money into this where one in four children suffer, f uh, 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 on average, mental health problems, and whether we are putting enough money into this? And it's a question, not rhetorical, but a question of all members whether indeed we are putting enough money in to help these young people out who do uh, suffer from poor mental health. Sorry, that's a decision. One of the decisions we're making today is whether we're uh, going to agree the additional investment in this service to support people with, young, with mental health problems. Uh, Councillor Fairburn. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for that report, Mark. Um, I'm just casting a keen eye over the Lockerbie Academy situation because obviously that's a school in my ward that I have quite a lot to do with. And I was recently there in relation to interviewing um, for a position at Syracuse. Anyway, that aside, I got talking to some of the children there and uh, I was keen to hear that they've got this new project up and running, that some of the actual pupils there are mentors for people in the school that are struggling with their mental health and other self-confidence issues and such like. Now, I, I notice here that you've got uh, a youth worker that drops in at lunchtime and it's quite a relatively high take up. Now, I just wondered if you were actually doing and engaging with these uh, staff members that are involved in this and the, the pupils that are delivering this as a service within the school itself. Mark? Thanks, Leader. Uh, Councillor Ferrer, in terms of the, uh, the schools, uh, when these projects were developed, uh, prior to us going to Education Committee in, in January for approval, uh, the Head Teacher Strategy Group, which includes the uh, had included at the time the Head Teacher from Lockerbie Academy, uh, were involved in developing the, the, the this this project and, and agreeing that this methodology uh, filled a gap that was there. So the, the, the head teachers across all the secondary schools have been hugely receptive to this. And I think that's shown by the 147 referrals in a few days, uh, the fact that, that they see a value in it within uh, the school. Uh, and within the, the report, uh, in, in, in terms of Appendix 2, you could see within that, you know, some comments from deputy heads and head teachers around the value of that and given some of the case studies around individual young people. So we are uh, very proactively engage with the school with us and we also have a in, in terms of the steering group who oversees the project the education of psychologists are involved in that as well who then link in with wider colleagues in education uh, and in the group specifically that you men mentioned in terms of the mentoring uh, project at Lockerbie Academy I, I know that uh, some of our youth work staff have also delivered training to, to some of those young people as well as part of the initial setup of that project and that would be consistent across uh, most of the schools across the region. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Leader. Um, I just wonder, Mark, um, what we do about um, a school which shows less um, improvement than you would necessarily want. Um, what then happens when you're looking at the whole cohort and they are feeling less optimistic about the future than more optimistic? Um, I... Um, I recognise the question about resources, <clears throat> but you know, £3,500 per child, um, if we uh, provide them with the tools to um, be all together, have all the, all the capacities that we require with Curriculum for Excellence, um, and they can manage to go forward um, as good citizens and confident people, um, I, I think is extremely good value. Um, so there's an argument to say that perhaps um, Councillor Scobie is correct that we ought to um, examine these these um, these particular budgets, um, notwithstanding putting more money into this um, ourselves today. 
um, to consider whether or not we are actually making the progress that we want to make. There's also a yes no question here, please, which is that have the broadband issues and the internet issues been sorted out? That seemed to me to be very basic. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Mark. Thanks, Doug. Um, in terms of the, 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 the first point, Councillor Maitland, I think the uh, you know the value of this uh, you know in terms of you know if you look at it as a spend to save, uh, which, which I'm always reluctant to do when describing anything, whether it be for young people or elderly people in terms of a spend to save. But if you look on it from a business model, from that perspective. Uh, uh, that's something that the whole partnership has has acknowledged, uh, and uh, because of the, the the potential within you know around variable results within different schools, the steering group who has overseen the this rollout of the schools project uh, will take the oversight uh, for this uh, community based model reporting into the communities committee. And if we have got specific challenges within certain schools, that then there is an opportunity to engage with the senior leadership teams of each of those schools individually to ensure that we put in place a localised uh, approach to that where we could share best practice from other schools uh, but also uh, deal with the issues that are specific to that community and that's why you, you, know, you can see within the report that the offer within schools is an example where the, the, is the schools get to choose what uh, methodology if you like they would like to see delivered because they know that school the best uh, and, uh, and the young people within it and that will be the same approach we put into the community. Uh, we've also uh, got in terms of being able to, to evidence, I think, a bit more uh, in terms of, you know, for this investment of, uh, you know, of 1.3 million over the three years, that uh, what other savings does that make to our council in terms of social work, but also to our NHS partners? Uh, and we're working with Education Scotland, who are very keen to partner with us in terms of looking at this in terms of uh, a cost-benefit analysis, so that at the end of the three years, we've actually got the evidence to show that uh, for that spend, actually it saved X figure in terms of the wider uh, public sector, uh, that, uh, and, and particularly the council, which then will hopefully provide rich data for uh, members to consider when evaluating the project as it moves on uh, over the next three years. Uh, thanks. Um, Councillor McKee. Uh, thanks, Leader. <coughs> Has there been a big spike in the number of youngsters qualifying or looking for this assistance? <coughs> it seems to be quite, it's quite concerning if that's the case. I'm just looking at uh, one of the papers here, Supports one-to-one -one support sessions. <coughs> You've had 53 sessions, five individual young people. So that, these five had these divided up at 53 sessions between them. That's a lot of work. Yeah, Mark? Yeah, I, I think what, what, what we find, Councillor McKee, can be that, that, that depending on uh, the severity uh, of the individual young person in terms of the, their anxiety and, and mental health issues, that sometimes that they may require support that goes on for, uh, you know, for up to six months. So that's where, in some cases, you know, where I think, uh, you know, if you look at you know footfall within a, a leisure centre or a youth centre, that quite often you know the measure of success is very high in numbers, and but in this case actually the measure of success could be you know that over a prolonged period of time it maybe is five or ten young people, but they're needing that significant investment over a long period of time, uh, and and that is where uh, you know the retention rate of uh, that we've got for the, the project that the council lever alluded to, which is the ninety nine percent plus. You know, when speaking to teaching colleagues, that, that's very unheard of for them, for some of these young people in terms of the, you know, the, the, the challenges they have in their life to actually turn up every week to, uh, or a few times a week to see uh, the youth workers that they're engaging with. And, and the 99%, uh, you know, retention rate is something that was way above our hope and aspiration at the start, but shows in terms of the benefit that young people are, are finding. And, and, and also that you know the, the 147 referrals we've had since you know in the, in the four days that we've, we've been taking them for the schools model is a, a, an increase of about 40 percent compared to the pilot project in the same year. So that will give members an indication of uh, you know the, the increase in that, and that's even before you know our teaching colleagues uh, get to know the young people maybe you know a bit 
further down the line in four, six, eight weeks' time for those that are maybe your seldom heard young people, the ones that are in that middle level that don't have a lot going on at home uh, and things that the teacher would maybe not normally pay attention to. So that's even before they get to that group that, that, that we're seeing that sort of increase, which tells us that this, this approach where we can offer that community-based model to support more young people is needed at this point. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Jean Maitland has indicated that she also had a question about internet access, which, which wasn't answered. I just wondered if you could answer that. And then we got to Councillor Carruthers, and my intention would be to go to the recommendations after that. Can you Thank reassure Councillor Maitland on the internet access issue? Yeah, apologies, Councillor Maitland. I, I, I missed that, that point. Um, the, at this point, uh, we are uh, doing, there's been significant work done across the, the council and with partners in, in third sector DNG around uh, supporting individuals in terms of access to devices uh, at home uh, during COVID and how they, they can use those devices within the, uh, the home in terms of schooling, but also for other uh, aspects that they can learn. So, so we, I think we are, we've still got a bit to go and what we'll also uh, be doing uh, is that uh, we're partnering through, we've received some additional funding through um, a na the National Connectivity Project specifically to youth work to be able to support young people to, uh, get, in terms of broadband connection, but also device where that's the problem, that being the problem, and we'll use that and tie that in with this program where if a young person that wants online uh, support as opposed to face-to-face -face support and we don't have the device or connectivity, we will be able to use some of that funding that we've received to be able to support that at home. Okay. Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, and thanks for uh, taking us to the recommendations. Mark, you spoke earlier about the cross-benefit analysis that would be undertaken. I think you said after three years. When I read this report, that, listen, so, so we are supportive of this in general terms, but it is a whack of money, so we need to understand how that's monitored, the effect that has but the cross-benefit analysis kept coming back to my mind, okay, there's wider organisations within the Friesen Galloway and there didn't seem to be a very high contribution from them. Uh, so is, it, is this not something we could, we could fund uh, for a year, do the cross-benefit analysis, then approach different authorities at that point in time? Is that something that's been thought about it? or have you thought that through and maybe that's not the, the appropriate way? Okay, Mark, and I should just say, uh, Councillor Ferguson has appeared on the list as well now, so we'll go to the recommendations after that. Uh, Mark, can you answer that question for Councillor Crothers? Uh, thanks, Councillor Crothers. Yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, whether it be a one year or three year, uh, our view on it was that uh, in order to make us the sustained support to young people that's required, then we need to invest in this for the long term. But, um, and that it takes us back to the point that I mentioned at the start, that if there is some additional funding that would come into the authority to support this, uh, from you know that would come to the partnership, there may be an opportunity to reduce that investment for uh, the council. So ultimately, we would um, we're, we're asking members to agree the total cost of this. But if there is some uh, additional funding come in, that contribution from the council may reduce. I uh, appreciate it's a, a significant uh, investment from the council, and, and I, I, you know, I'm choosing that word investment wisely in terms of. The, uh, the the impact this can have on uh, on young people uh, and, and and their mental health over a, a prolonged period. But my uh, uh, advice to members would be that we need to to look in this at a long term because what we wouldn't want to do is fund it for a year and for any reason we then don't have that funding in the uh, to continue in a year's time and we've got young people that are maybe 60, 70 percent through the support that they've got and then we have to stop that support at that time. Thanks for that, Mark. Lady, if you don't mind, just a couple of quick comments. I'm very quick. Just uh, then so, bring in Councillor Ferguson, and after that, yeah, then. Thank you. No, so, so I appreciate your, your, your marks coming back. So certainly, it wouldn't be our intention to see this stop after the year. I just I think we'd have a stronger argument uh, after doing that cost-benefit uh, analysis to say here it is to the wider partners. This does work. This is how much you're saving. This is the benefits of to, to, to our young people. I think it's harder to win that argument once you've been paying for it for three years solely. Uh, when you get to that point, it's more difficult to win that argument. Okay. Councillor Ferguson. Um, th thanks very much, Leader. I'm looking at 3.4, and it's the actions and the approach of the Children's Services Executive Group, which for me are the, the crucial part in this, because my understanding here is this, um, whilst this meets the low level of mental health needs of young people in the first instance, or it's an introduction into that, that process, it's like a triage system where um, and what I would really like um, is some indication 
of how the escalation process would kick in if uh, this does not work and we need to go into mental illness, for example, as opposed to just health and well-being. Um, so I think there is another bit of work in here and I am just acutely aware if it, if it escalates into that clinical intervention stage, it will be an IGB issue, it will not be a council issue. Because mental health is uh, part of it and if they are over 16, um, they will be in that system. Uh, Mark. Yeah, no, I think Councillor Ferguson's points well made. Um, and an example of that, you know, I would give is that you know just earlier today, before full council started, where we've got a, we've had to deal with a youth work service for a young person that will need significant mental health support from uh, the, the through the IGB. Uh, at, but their first port of call has been to the to the youth work service at the point of absolute crisis in their life, uh, and. Uh, and we've got the exist the, the referral pathways have been created over the last year, and and I can reassure Councillor Fergus and other members that those pathways are there. Where like this morning, where we've got that young person in in, in absolute crisis, that those pathways are there to be able to make sure that's effective, seamless, and those young people can uh, receive that additional support uh, when required. Thanks. Can we go to the recommendations? We have to note two. This is the endorsement of the uh, Children's Services Executive Group. And three is to agree the investment, and that is to agree the, the investment over the three years. So are we prepared to do that, to agree the investment, investment over the three years? Okay, good. And we note the scrutiny monitoring arrangements. Thank Chair, you. just on the scrutiny one, it's maybe something Mark could bring back in the figures that come, but if you're changing the cohort every year, can we go back maybe in a year or two's time if someone hasn't used the system and see how they're coping and have we given them the tools or the ability to cope with any issues that they had before and going forward so that we can then actually get the cost benefit because we took if it's even if it's one child uh, or a young person out of that situation and we've given him a better life because we've enabled them to do something and that gives you the idea of where we need to be. Yeah, uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, I'll do that. The, the real benefit of this system is actually embedded around the child, so it's in the school system. So even though the teamwork and the intervention, the school will continue to track. So absolutely, we'll develop that process and perhaps bring back a, a, a side note following the meeting to give you some assurance, Council Hislop, of how that will work. But yes, we never lose sight of the child. And I think why other councils are so attractive to this approach, it, 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 it allows an intervention, but within the getting it right for every child framework, so you never lose the child. So we should be able to do that, but we'll, we'll confirm that um, with the side note after the meeting back to members. It would, of course, be interesting to know further on in their lives whether, in fact, by the tools that you gain here, help to prevent the sort of issues of self-medication, of suicide and others, which, which often affect people later on. So, yeah, we, that might be more difficult to monitor, uh, Councillor Ferguson. Um, thanks very much. I'm really pleased with the Chief's intervention there because I'm actually wondering, Gavin, if at the same time we could get some indication of the number of young people who've been in an escalation process going up into more acute uh, clinical interventions. Um, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be really careful we don't identify somebody. I, I get that. Uh, happy to provide information and if we are straying into territory obviously we can share it confidentially with members so you get the fullest information I'll, I'll have a chat with Mark after about how we could present the information to you well thanks okay if we can go on to uh, item 11 which is the appointment to Wigton Divisional Licensing Board uh, which came up to us last month as well. The report asks members to consider appointment to a vacancy on the Wigton Divisional Licensing Board in accordance with the Licensing Scotland Act 2005. This uh, appointment was due to be considered at full council on 30th of July, but we agreed to defer it to this meeting as there was no obvious candidate coming forward. Uh, so again, we ask, do we have any volunteers or nominees? Sorry? He did that last time. <laughs> okay, because the other uh, the other avenue open to us is to reduce the membership to five members on that licensing board. Now, I don't think that's necessarily a problem because Nithsdale operates on five members, uh, so it would be possible to 
to operate and fire members. And I think uh, Councillor Crothers made an important point last time. It actually makes it difficult for anybody else from outside, for another licensing board, to volunteer to take part because they have to go through the training again. And I don't understand why that is, because having done the training at the beginning of the council, it, we all got trained together. We were all members of different licensing boards, and we all got trained together. So why we would have to be trained separately in order to help to, to help out another licensing board? I have no idea, and I've, nobody's actually been able to answer that uh, particularly. But uh, I think probably what we need to, uh, to do, uh, my, my suggestion is that we reduce the membership to five. Is that agreement to, uh, to everybody, including the people online? Because there may be people from Wigginshire Licensing Board online at the moment. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So we'll, shall we agree to, to reduce that to five? Good. Now moving on to um, the minutes for approval, uh, which are item 12. These were deferred from last month as well. We've got four, uh, the first being the ad hoc COVID-19 subcommittee of the 12th of June 2020. Uh, and I'm, I will move those. I don't know whether people have been given their list of what they're measuring, but uh, the suggestion was that Councillor Ferguson would would uh, second that. I'll I'll follow your coattails, <laughs> leader. Yeah, absolutely no problem. Okay, thanks very much. And then there's the ad hoc COVID subcommittee of the 19th, uh, which was uh, uh, an appointment. So can I have some? Happy to move. Uh, right. Okay. And can I have a seconder for the? Thank you. Uh, then there's the Civic Government Licensing Panel of 10th of July, which I will move. Have a second. Happy to second. Right. And the Whithorn and Wigton Common Good Fund Subcommittee of the 18th of February 2020, some time ago indeed. Can I have somebody from Whithorn and Wigton Community Common Good uh, Subcommittee to, to, set, to propose in second, please? Leader, I'm quite happy to move. Th thanks, Jim. Can I? Yep. I'll second, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank thanks. You. That's got others. And now we move on. I have no uh, business deemed urgent uh, due to the need for a decision. So we now uh, need to ask members to agree to the adoption of a resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of Section 50A, 4 and Paragraph 6 and 9 of Part 1 of Schedule 7A of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. Are we content to do so? Yep. Um, how do we...